Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> it is Thursday, March 3 at 1 o'clock. This is the regular meeting of the City Council, the Library and Observatory Board, Housing Authority Board, and the City Council representing the Redevelopment Successor Agency. And now Jeremy Gleim, our Director of Planning, will lead us in a flag salute. Please stand and begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Christy. Uh, may we have a roll call, please? Council Member Downs? Present. Council Member Kite? Here. Council Member Smotrich? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Townsend? Here. Mayor Weil. Here. Uh, welcome, everybody. Beautiful day in the valley. Uh, we have a presentation uh, at this time, uh, which will be an update on the Akrashore Arena and the Coachella Valley Firebirds. Pretty exciting things coming to the valley. That's going to be presented by Arturo Avalas, uh, Community Engagement Manager. Arturo, if you would, please. Yes, how's it going, everyone? Uh, I have a very exciting presentation for you guys today. I hope you guys enjoy it. Let me go ahead and share my PowerPoint. All right, so we have a state-of-the-art facility with upscale hospitality coming to the Coachella Valley late 2022. On January 26th, we announced our naming rights partner for the next 10 years. The arena is now Akershire Arena. This is a rendering of the arena's main entrance. This is what's gonna show from the I-10 freeway here. And we are on schedule to open late 2022. Oakview Group owns the arena and will manage the arena. Oakview Group is the largest developer of sports and entertainment facilities in the world. We are investing $4.5 billion on new arena developments over the next three years. Akershire Arena alone is costing us $400 million to bring to life. Here are some of our newest developments. Climate Pledge Arena in Seattle opened October 2021. UBS Arena in New York opened November 2021. Moody Center in Austin, Texas will open April 18th, 2022 and the rest are opening within the next three years. Our leaders are Tim Laiwiki and Irvin Asaf. Tim Laiwiki is a resident of Indian Wells. He has created many iconic music festivals and currently holds 13 rings uh, from the sports teams that he has partnered with that have won a championship. Irvin Asaf was named the most powerful person in the music industry by Billboard. They both have a home here in the Coachella Valley and they are our leaders. <clears throat> As I mentioned, our ownership locally is the Oakview Group. We have a partnership with the Seattle Kraken in Seattle. And we also have a partnership with Live Nation, the number one largest concert promoter in the world and the Burger Foundation who owns the Classic Club. We have strategically partnered with Live Nation to bring you the best entertainment in the world. Just to give you an idea of how big Live Nation is, they, uh, they have 30, thousand plus events in 40 countries annually. They are the world's biggest artists in management. Uh, they have the biggest list of artists and the best artists in the world. And there is a Live Nation concert every 18 minutes around the world. That's how big Live Nation is, our partner. We are building the most progressive, responsive, and sustainable venues in the world. CV Arena will utilize renewable resources to strive for carbon neutrality by 2025. The facility will be powered by solar almost 100% on non-event days and roughly 30% will be powered by solar during events, but we are shooting for carbon neutrality 100% by 2025. A big concern for our residents is of course the traffic. Uh, the classic club infrastructure was built to handle 50,000 people. So there is some infrastructure in place. Um, 
the arena will only have about 10,000 people when it is filled up. And on top of that, we're working on a traffic control plan. Another great thing is that hockey games will start around 7 p.m. and concerts around 8 p.m., which is after the big traffic wave. We will have a parking lot for 3,000 cars. As you can see, we will also have three large marquees right by the I-10. And we have also partnered with Xavier High School for additional parking if it is needed. Hmm. This is a nice, accurate aerial rendering of how the arena is going to look. You can see the I-10 here going eastbound. Uh, what many people don't know is that we have a community ice skating rink right next to the arena, which is here to the left. So we will have two ice sheets, one inside the arena and one in the community center, which will be available for the community seven days a week. This is a rendering of how the arena is going to look when we have concerts. As you can see, we covered the ice here to provide floor level seats. Uh, we have designed our arena to create an intimate experience. 90% of the seats are actually in the lower level. So this is all general admission here. All the VIP and suites are at the top, top level. And then the seats for the suites will be right in front of the suite. This is an accurate rendering of how the arena is going to look during hockey games. This is an accurate rendering of the main concourse. Um, the arena will have a modernism interior design. We tag texture and materials. We use light colors to evoke happy, energetic, peaceful moods, but we also added blacks, golds, and silvers to provide you with a night of elegance. The surrendering of the bunker club and VIP club areas, very exclusive. We will provide upscale hospitality, the best in the world. Concert capacity will be 11,000 up to 11,500. Hockey capacity will be 10,000. And the facility is approximately 300,000 square feet. Uh, suites and premium seating will be at the top level. These will be suites here. This is the stage The I-10 would be here at the bottom, right? So we have a total of 20 suites. We have some VIP lofts here, which is similar to holding a suite, but uh, it's individual seating, right? So it's like a shared suite. And then we will have a bunker club at the bottom, which is very exclusive as well. It's a VIP area, which will be down here. Music and sports will be the anchor tenants. We will bring you the best artists and sporting events in the world. We will offer 100 plus nights of events, 36 hockey games, 40 concerts, 30 other events such as boxing, basketball, UFC, Disney on Ice, WWE, and much more. The arena was made for music and was built with live touring in mind, state-of-the-art facility that will provide the best experience in the world. We will host residencies, which means that you, we will provide you with more opportunities to see your favorite shows. Uh, I have, uh, they have asked me before, what is a residency? A residency is when an artist performs more than one time in a, in, in the same place, kind of like Vegas, all the residencies, the artists are just in one hotel. So that's what, that's what that means. For opportunities to win tickets, receive discounts and more information, you can sign up uh, to our newsletter, AccrashareArena.com. Now we're going to get into the hockey stuff. The arena was built for hockey. We will have 36 home games a year. Season uh, starts in October and it will run through the end of April. Um, our team is the AHL, Coachella Valley Firebirds. We are the NHL Seattle Kraken Farm Team. We are the first professional team at a professional level. We are actually considered professional. It's a step below the uh, NHL. Uh, the Kraken will feed off the AHL and we will work together to provide players as, as needed. And we are the first professional team at that caliber in the Valley. The Firebird, our logo. The Firebird is a spiritual descendant of the Kraken. The Kraken is in the deep dark ocean below and the Firebird rises out of the flames to soar high above. If you look at the uh, colors, colors are the exact opposite uh, uh, from the Kraken to the Firebird. As you can see, uh, the Kraken primary color is the ice blue but they have a red alert eye. Our primary color is red alert, but we have the ice blue eye. So one of them represents fire. The other one represents ice, sea and desert, yin and yang. 
This is our secondary logo, logo here up above. Uh, you can see mountains here at the top and you can see a palm tree with nine fronds. Each frond represents a city in the Coachella Valley. Both logos will be included in special color variants to represent diversity. Here's a timeline. We are on schedule to open late 2022. Um, the new arena location announcement was made in the spring. We broke ground late June. Firebirds and logo, uh, Firebirds name and logo were revealed in the fall. And we just um, partnered up with Acrisure to name the arena Acrisure Arena. Firebirds jersey was revealed not in January and topping out ceremony was a few weeks ago. So we put up our last steel beam a few weeks ago and now they're covering it all up. And if you go by the arena, you can see that they're starting to cover it up. And like I said, we are on schedule to open late 2022. This is a really, really cool video that announces uh, the naming of the arena. It's a very short video. I'm gonna go ahead and play it for you guys. Valley Arena now set to move forward. Riverside County. The Park project, which is set to house the newest American League hockey team, arena going up where it's going to have sports entertainment. I could not be more proud to announce the partnership with Acrisure on the new arena. OVG and Acrisure are dedicated to using this platform to improve the lives of everybody at Coachella Valley. We're tackling climate change. The big goal here is to become completely carbon neutral for operations by 2025. I think the community is really going to support hockey to have a vibrant place. It's especially exciting to bring an arena there. This is about wanting to do something spectacular. There's not going to be another one of these in our lifetime. So let's go ahead and continue. Uh, this is a, uh, these pictures were taken by a drone on February 9th. So you can see we are moving fast. And if you go by the arena now, you can see that there's a lot more that's already done. You can also visit our live cam at AcrisureArena.com. There's the live cam on there where you can see everything that's happening on site. Uh, our jersey reveal was January 24th. You can now order your jerseys at cvfirebirds.com. You can customize them and they should be available in the fall. Uh, let me go ahead and play this quick uh, Firebirds jersey reveal video, which is awesome. I love this one. We have been very active in the community as well. I'm the community engagement manager and uh, I, I not only do presentations and attend events, but we are also starting street hockey clinics with various uh, youth recreation organizations in the entire Coachella Valley. Shannon Miller, our VP of community relations and branding is a hockey hall of fame coach who won an Olympic medal. She is heading the, the street hockey clinics. She's actually the one in the picture here teaching the kids. Um, and these are some of our partners, the YMCA, the ACES program will, well, actually the ACES program is up here. We took uh, 200 kids to their first ever professional street, professional hockey game. We took them to a Ducks game and mm -hmm. they are going to begin uh, 21 programs in 21 different sites. So they will be doing street hockey after school. Uh, YMCA is going to start a league, I believe, an adult league as well. If anybody is interested, they will start a street hockey adult league. I think that's starting pretty soon. Uh, we've partnered with Desert Recreation District. We've done street hockey clinics all over the valley with them. 
And also we've done clinics for the Desert Sands Unified School District teachers, PE teachers, and some of the kids, and of course the Boys and Girls Club. We have a retail store in El Paseo across the street from the Apple store. You can also purchase Firebirds gear online at cvfirebirds.com and give a deposit for season tickets. We are at 4,600 season tickets uh, sold at the moment. Um, we, we, uh, we, we only have 5,000 available, so they're running out pretty quick. If you guys are interested, I've, I've been asked about it. Uh, the deposit for general admission is $100 and the, the seats for 36 home hockey games is is $450 for general admission and then it goes up and there's club seating there's packages there's packages that include firebirds games and all the events and some of them even include food and beverage so if you guys are interested you can visit cvfirebirds.com uh, and you can give a deposit there and somebody from uh, ticketing from sales will contact you and they will give you a presentation and show you all your options all right that is it with my presentation do you guys have any questions? Well, Arturo, thank you very much. Um, it's extremely exciting. It's it's going to be a great addition for our entire valley, and I and I'm sure we're all going to see people walking around with Firebird mm -hmm. shirts on as mm -hmm. the year goes on. It's very nostalgic for me. Uh, I'll tell you this that. Uh, as a teenager in high school, when I was growing up, uh, I used to go to the New York Rover hockey games, which is the basically, and this is Arturo, this is before you were thought about by your <laughs> parents. Um, they were the farm team for the New York Rangers. Okay. And so I used to go there uh, and loved it. And it, what a great way to learn about hockey uh, and to get involved. And you gravitated from being a Rover fan to a Ranger fan. And I'm sure that that will be the case here, that you will cultivate a whole new audience of people. And uh, it will be very exciting and, and it'll be a great addition to our entire valley. So thank you. Uh, to you and, and management and all of the people that are working hard to make this a reality. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, is there anybody on the dais that has any questions of any kind? Richard? Yeah, it, it's uh, really exciting to see what's going on with the new uh, program. I think working with the children of our area through the various club organizations is really going to be exciting and cause uh, the uh, the depth of the program to grow and grow. So it's about time. They've tried several times to, to get ice rinks in the desert, uh, but this one really looks for real now and uh, look forward to an exciting season and uh, come back and tell us more about what's going on. Yes, I will. Um, I'm planning to circle back hopefully in a couple months uh, to share all the new updates. And yes, uh, one thing that's going to be different from this arena and, and the other ice skating rinks is that we actually have anchor tenants, right? We, we're going to have events. We're going to have a hockey team. So we are going to be able to keep this arena alive for the community. Very good. Mr. Mayor, I do That's have a great. question, if I may. Yes, Charlie. Is there any consideration of it being a given time to people to come and just skate, open skating, with or without an organ? Yeah, yeah. Um, we are going to have a... A bunch of different programs we're even talking about slate hockey we're talking about uh floor hockey we will have events for the whole community for everybody everybody will be included in everything that we do at the arena very good thank you welcome thank you any other comment yeah well i would just like to welcome you also and i'm very excited to uh have you in the valley and and to have uh, all the children participate uh when i was in my 20s, I took up figure skating, and uh, I always wanted to try hockey skating. Um, I regret not doing it. I just didn't think wearing a little short skirt would be very becoming with the hockey skates and uh, uh, with a hockey stick. So that was one of my regrets. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody out there on the ice and a welcome addition to our, our valley. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. 
Welcome, Firebird. So uh, like uh, the mayor, when I was a youngster in Buffalo, New York, I played hockey too. So it's great uh, to see a professional hockey arena come to the desert. Thank you for your presentation and your update, Ar Arturo. Uh, much appreciated. Thanks. Thank you guys so much. Do we have any other questions? I think that'll do it, Arturo, and thank you again. And, you know, we look, we look forward to uh, you returning uh, uh, with an update uh, in the near future. Thanks so much. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Have a good meeting. Thank All you. right. Thank you. Uh, we will now go to uh, non-agenda public comments. And, Christy, uh, do we have any uh, requests? We do. The first speaker is Tom Wheel. I wish what I was about to, what I'm about to say is exciting as what I just heard. It's just fabulous news. When I was last here, I think I spoke to you about uh, security at the airport and the fact that the uh, boxing club was centered as being uh, responsible. I'm pleased to tell you that uh, in the last two months, with the guidance of uh, Martha's Village and Kitchen and Village, that uh, there have been no incidents whatsoever. And we are all looking forward to, uh, I should also add that there were un, unduplicated over 500 uh, uh, visits to the uh, boxing club this past month. So we're quickly outgrowing that facility as well and they're looking forward to their renovated new facility in North Palm Springs. <clears throat> The airport is looking at instituting biometrics to speed up the process of getting onto a plane and getting into the secured areas. <clears throat> it's, I just left an operations meeting this morning. Uh, it's in its formative stage, but uh, it's a coming event, and I think that will help alleviate some of the problems that we have at the airport. Um, we are really victims uh, speaking of that, uh, we're victims of our own success. We've added a number of airlines, and the physical facility has not grown with that demand. We have luggage problems. We have noise problems. Um, I have suggested that uh, until we can relieve the situation, so we have three luggage belts. That's insufficient when between 11 and 1, when we get these larger planes in, uh, which translates into probably 400 or more bags per plane. Uh, it's If you visualize a milk bottle with a small opening and a large back, that's exactly what we have. We just don't have the capacity to get those bags in. We do have the ability to get them off the airplanes, but it's just we just don't have that capacity. <clears throat> that, in time, will be changed. We will have to move the car rental um, areas, their storage areas for cars. Uh, we're going to need to move into that area and take them to a, uh, a distant location. Um, I have suggested as an interim um, stopgap, and I believe it's been accepted, that we um, consider or we're going to have two vans that will... Uh, be able to use parking at the uh, at the airport is a, a terrible problem. We have 454 parking spots. Uh, I have been there personally, and I can drive around and not find a place to park. Uh, so we're using these overflow lots, and we will have two vans that will be coming and going periodically uh, as a stopgap measure until we can figure out long term what what we need to do. That's basically it. If you've got any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. No. Ed, I have a question. Yes. Uh, over the last week or two, I've been to the airport maybe three or four times. The worst traffic mess I've ever seen at, at an airport like this. What are we doing to improve the overall traffic uh, patterns in the, in the uh, airport? That was one of the subjects that we talked about today. Unfortunately, we just don't have the space because we need a wider area. We need to take certain uh, vehicles out of that equation 
and it, it right now is a problem that we're trying to deal with. We have consultants, but frankly, we're just we're victims of our own success. We've been too successful and brought in too many planes that once they land, there's no place to, for the passengers or the baggage to go. And I raised that fear that we're going to be driving people to other airports, driving them in, encouraging them to go to other airports. Yeah, it's very much a, a concern. Well, stay in there. Keep fighting for us. Yes, sir. Sure will. Any other questions? Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Nice to see you. The next speaker is Patrick Lowry. Good afternoon. Patrick Lowry, 17-year uh, resident of Rancho Mirage. I have a couple of points to make. First of all, excellent presentation on the hockey. I'm a longtime hockey player, and I'm feeling all the aches and pains now. And it wasn't that good. I want to suggest something to you. It's hard for me to keep up with all that goes on here because of my travels and plans. Let me give you something here. Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies, which I belong to, you may want to look that up and get some good ideas on housing. That uh, It might help you a little bit in understanding uh, subsidized housing and affordable housing development. Fantastic group, and you can't do better than Harvard. So and if they let me sign up, let's all go, right? Now, the next thing is uh, I want to see the city say something about the Ukraine. I don't know how you do that, but you need to put a symbol on the city site. This is a tragedy. You know that. I don't need to explain it to you. Don't need to talk about democracies. Don't need to talk about uh, what everybody did in the military. This is sad stuff. And they need our support. So hopefully I can see something go on our site, a banner of some sort. Now, that, that draws me to something else, which is uh, the uh, $150,000 matching grant for the uh, museum, which I think is great. I sent a note off to the museum, not heard back, because I was bothered by something. Something I'm bothered to by the city. Didn't see anything on Black History Month. And I didn't see anything from the city on Black History Month. And I placed a couple of calls to Mr. Cotting, haven't heard anything back yet. But let's pay attention to something like that. And the one person who called me back was Aaron at the library. What a fantastic guy. Called me up after hours, told me what they were doing for Black History Week. Made me happy to hear. Now, March 8th, do you guys know what March 8th is? Women's International Day. You know what this is? That's the symbol, right? To end bias against women. Again, I'd like to see the city participate in some of these adventures. I think it'd be good and healthy for all of you. And this issue of uh, uh, standing up for some of the rights of people is terribly important. So hope to see you do that. And then I'm going to leave you with some numbers. And I'll address these next time I get a chance to, to get into town. One in 26, one in 44, and one in 24, and 89. We'll have some fun talking about that next time I see you. Great for the hockey arena. Uh, pay attention to this. And uh, pay attention to black history. Take care. Thank you for your comments. Christy? That was the last speaker card. Is there anyone in the audience who did not submit a speaker card but wishes to make a non-agenda public comment? Okay, then we can go to the remote audience. Again, this is for non-agenda public comments. So if your comments are regarding an item that is actually listed on the agenda, then those comments will be requested at the time that item is discussed. So if you're participating remotely and want to make a comment, you would push um, star nine on your telephone or press raise hand on your Zoom screen. So the first person we have is Rob Bergstein. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor, Council Members, and City Staff. My name is Rob Bergstein, and I'm a resident of Magnesia Falls Cove. Uh, although I know these are not an agendized um, topics, and I know you can't comment on them, I wanted to discuss some aspects of uh, being able to participate in city governments and getting information on agendized items. Um, First, uh, uh, when I first moved here, there was an agendized item that I couldn't figure out from the um, posted agenda what it was, nor was there any staff report attached to the agenda. Um, I had to drop off my dog's uh, licensing, so I came down to City Hall and was initially told I'd have to file a records request to get a staff report for a City Council agendized item. 
someone corrected that and there is an area where it's sort of if you search hard enough you can get staff reports um, i come from another municipality where when um, council agendas are posted there's a hyperlink in the agenda item that brings up the full staff report including if it's an item going on for a number of years all the staff reports not just a one or two page summary so i'd like to encourage if a city manager can help find a way for staff to embed a, a direct link in all agendas uh, to bring up any and all staff reports secondly um even participating in this meeting um, um i called christy i can't see if you're there but thank you for your help there were no instructions on the council agenda as to how to participate remotely um, if there could be instructions on the agenda saying if you wish to participate by zoom follow this link and then raise your hand uh, same thing if you're calling on the phone uh, secondly the zoom link uh, on your agenda is not functioning um, if you try clicking on the zoom link it comes up um, uh, not i think a non-functioning meeting or something that was wrong uh, if you hover your uh, mouse over that link to bring it up it still does not open so I literally had to write down the Zoom meeting link, go to my Zoom account, enter that, go back and enter the password. So if we can just find a way to make it much easier for people to um, participate, particularly remotely, um, you know, the COVID is not um, going away. I think I'm not alone and not willing to uh, come back to meetings just yet. So I just wanna encourage if there are ways that staff can help find uh, a process for this, uh, the citizens to easier, more easily participate in public meetings, be a, a move in the right direction. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Christy. The next speaker is Randy Felick. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Weil uh, and council members. My name is Randy Feilish and I am a humane policy volunteer for Humane Society United States. I am also a homeowner on Mission Hills North Golf Course. I'm grateful to you city council members and for the city for its environmental values and stewardship of our wildlife. I'm proud to have a residence here in Rancho Mirage. Last week after a large public outcry, Mission Hills Country Club canceled their decision to trap and kill coyotes. We are very grateful uh, that they canceled their plans. Moving forward, my concern is about the future illegal coyote trapping that may occur. Uh, we also wanna make sure that all laws are followed. According to California Fish and Game Law, Title 14, Section 465.5, traps may not be set within 150 yards of any structure or resident without any written consent of the landlord. Um, this California law was not followed um, last week by the Mission Hills Golf Course and their plans to trap, or it was not followed by their trapper. Um, moving forward, um, the city of Rancho Mirage should really think about having a coyote management plan. Many cities have adopted their these kind of types of plans uh, called coyote management plans that emphasize public education, public safety, and behavior modifications with a tiered response through California Fish and Wildlife. In addition, uh, the city should think about bringing in the California Fish and Wildlife Wildlife Watch Program, which is a program that gets the community members involved and teaches education instead of killing. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Christy. That was the last speaker raising their hand online, Mr. Mayor. Okay, that will conclude our uh, non-agenda public comments and we will now go to council board member comments. And Charlie, I'll start with you. Very good, thank you, appreciate it. Change the glasses. Thank you everyone. You may have probably heard me refer to our wonderful amphitheater as the Hollywood Bowl of Rancho Mirage. Well, I hope some of you were able to catch Mamma Mia there last weekend. Over a thousand people attended the two night performances of the show, which were sold out for weeks. Our friends and theater partners, Desert Theatricals, spent months and months rehearsing and preparing their Broadway style musicals under our beautiful desert skies. 
If you did miss Mamma Mia, tickets are still available for the next presentation, which is Annie Get Your Gun. And also a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. To get information on those, you visit <clears throat> deserttheatricals.com for more information. Be the first to know about upcoming amphitheater programming by signing up to receive the city's weekly digital news letter, which is Rancho Mirage Weekly. Visit Rancho Mirage dot California government to subscribe. In addition, our library and observatory has a wonderful lineup of free programming coming in March, April, and May, from operas to lectures and more theater productions, as you can see there. Visit the library's website at ranchomiragelibrary.org for details on their free programming. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's great. Thanks, Charlie. What a great lineup and what a great opportunity for our residents and visitors to participate. It is. It's yeah. just, you know, it's just terrific. It's outstanding. Growing, growing, growing every season, too. Absolutely. Iris? I do have uh, some comments in regard to emergency preparedness. Uh, one of my favorite subjects, and before I start, I would like to introduce someone sitting in the audience, and uh, it is Mary Lou Souter. And Mary Lou, maybe you could stand up and just wave to everyone. She is the chair lady of our Emergency Preparedness Commission and has been on the commission for many, many years and uh, does a phenomenal job, and she has come here and spoken many, many times. So it is an... Obviously, not a matter of if we're going to have an earthquake, but it seems to be when. We seem to be long overdue, and um, I wanted to show a couple slides of how to prepare. The first one, of course, you've seen many, many times, but some people are probably not aware of it, but now, uh, now that people are out and about, they're going to restaurants more often. One of the things that you should think about when you go into a restaurant and you're sitting at a table, is if there is an earthquake, how about just jumping underneath the table? Protect yourself with something, a hard surface over your head. And when you talk about covering, that means take one hand, put it over the back of your neck so you can cover the vital area on the back of your neck. And hold on. There's going to be a lot of shaking going on when we have a major earthquake and you're gonna to wanna to hold on to whatever uh, item you're hiding under because it has a tendency to move with all the different shaking. Uh, thank you, Jason. Can you move on to the next one? Is our emergency supplies. And if you could just take a, a good look at some of the things that are offered here, they are very important. A first aid kit, not only for your home, but in your car important documents that you want to have on hand, probably in a go bag, a can opener, a hand-operated uh, can opener, because we may not even have electricity, a flashlight, some batteries, some utensils, some protein, lots and lots of water. You have to figure at least a gallon of water per day per person. And when you have your food lined up, and you have lots of canned foods, especially your canned pet foods, make sure you look at the expiration date. You want to make sure that if things are expired, they need to be renewed. I renew mine every October, and that just seems to be a signal to me when I know that Halloween is coming about. Next one, Jason, please. And my advice is to go around your home, take your cell phone camera, and photograph everything you have. Take photographs even of your photographs. Open your drawers, take photographs of your clothing in your closet, all your furniture, all your entertaining supplies, and next slide, Jason, all your shoes. These are only a portion of my shoes, unfortunately, but if you are going to put in a claim to your insurance company, and you want to say you have 50 pair of shoes, chances are they're going to ask for some kind of evidence showing that you actually have 50 pair of shoes 
and all the other claims that you're going to be putting in. So take pictures. My suggestion is to put it on three separate flash drives. If you have a deposit box, a safety deposit box in your bank, put one of the flash drives in your safety deposit box. Keep one for yourself at home. And then send a third one to a relative that's out of town. So you'll have all the photographs available and you'll be able to turn them into the insurance company if the time comes. Also create a to-go bag. Obviously you'll need to have all your documents, copies of your documents, some clothing, some medication, your extra eyeglasses, some walking shoes, and toiletries, including toilet paper. <clears throat> you want to have it in your car, you want to have it ready, and you want to be able to jump into action should you need to. Also, you can go ahead, Jason, with the next slide. Uh, if you have in your, uh, pro in your car a little bag for protein bars, that's always good, even on a, a hot day when you want some extra nourishment. Also keep in your car some blankets, a flashlight, and anything else that you might need for your personal needs. So I wanted to show a couple things. Jason, could you put a hold on that slide for just a minute? Because I wanted to show a couple items that you might want to also consider. Things that I have at my home and things that I find very important and now instead of going to someone's home and bringing a bottle of wine or flowers, I bring an item like this that is for emergency preparedness. This happens to be a crank flashlight, radio, cell phone charger, and a siren. They're about $25 now at your local hardware store. Uh, they do all the things that you could probably need and want during an emergency and just treat yourself to having something that is going to be a great value. Another thing you might want to see about is putting some straps on some of your big items at home. Some of your cabinets, some of the tables, even I have actually uh, a lot of fishing tackle, 50 pound fishing tackle. Uh, attached to my lamps and attached to a lot of the other heavy items that I don't want flying around the room in case of an emergency and an earthquake. So if you're concerned about getting the right kind of foods, here's a little bag that you might want to look into. They have all kinds of freeze dries items on the internet. This happens to be a chili mac with beef. And would you believe this is going to be good and won't expire until 2047. So you don't have to worry about replacing anything real fast, but just keep it on hand. And when you have a chance, come by City Hall and pick up one of our emergency preparedness pamphlets. Got a lot of information and a lot of pictures showing what to supply yourself with what is important, and how to go about protecting yourself before, during, and after an emergency, and especially an emergency um, effects of an earthquake. I also wanted to mention one more thing, um, because it's so important to protect ourselves in this day and age regarding fraud and scams and cyber terrorism. I beg of you to please be careful when you open emails. If you don't know the sender, be extra, extra careful. I know they're very convincing sometimes, they look very official, but if you're all at all concerned, forward it to the person who allegedly sent it to you and ask them if they are actually the person who is the sender. Another fraud is the grandma and grandpa phone call. And nothing more scary than having a child or who has a disguised voice, because these are professionals. They call you, they sound panicky. It's easy as a grandparent to get panicky yourself. And if you have five, six, seven, ten grandchildren, you can't always identify the voice. So they ask for money, they ask for gift cards, 
And very often, people succumb and become a victim. They have good intentions. They run and get some gift cards, and they send them off. And then they think, maybe I didn't react the right way. So before you react, ask a lot of questions of the person that is calling you. Call that person's parents, if you can, and find out if that person is in a distressful situation. The parents should probably know about it. But before you send any money, before you send any gift cards, make sure of the sender that you're going to be sending it to. Uh, it's easy to fall victim. It's easy to call, be caught off guard. And it's easy to panic. So we all have good intentions. We're all very concerned. And especially in this day and age, somebody is out there trying to take our money and make us alarmed. So anyway, please be prepared. Please check into emergency preparedness. If you already have a lot of supplies, look them over and see if there's anything you need to add. And just go on our website and find out if there's something that you haven't thought of. And um, supply yourself the best way you can. And thank you so much. That's it, Ted. Thank you, Iris. Steve. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So. Um, Charlie, Iris, Ted, and Richard, I think I might be a little irritated. And I want to tell you why. Okay. So over the last couple of weeks, I've read mostly on social media about backroom deals that were made to bring Disney to Section 31. Now, I sat on the Planning Commission for about two and a half years, and now for the last two or three months uh, on this council. And not once have any of you shown me where this backroom is located, where we supposedly make these deals. So I went back to the records in 2019 uh, just to make sure that my memory serves me right. And it does. In fact, there was a full environmental impact report that was prepared. So I went back, I searched for it. Was it hard to find? It's posted right there on the city's website for anybody to, to, uh, uh, to read and to understand. And all of the environmental risks and mitigants are there. And they're planned out in some cases for years into the future the noise issues, the traffic issues, and the water issues are all outlined in the environmental impact report. And I also took a look at the planning department staff report that was presented to the planning commission right here in this chamber, and about a month later presented to the city council right here in this chamber. And um, after a full public review, uh, entitlements were granted to DMB development of Scottsdale, Arizona, not Disney. Disney never was and never has been a developer of Section 31. It's DMB of Scottsdale, Arizona. And if you look at your screen, DMB has significant background in uh, developing large-scale projects like this. Uh, over 30 years of develop development experience, they pride themselves in crafting communities in one-of-a-kind settings, and they pride themselves in doing the best they can to develop communities in harmony with the environment and the culture of the locations where they develop their projects. Uh, they've developed projects in uh, states all around the West, Hawaii, Arizona, Utah, Texas, here in California. Uh, and there's extensive information on their website. Jason, if you go to the next screen, you'll see this screen on DMB Development's website. And you can click on any one of these communities, and you can see videos of the way in which they develop projects that are, in fact, harmonious with the local communities where they develop. So after DMB was granted entitlements, they began their search, as every developer does, for contractors and design firms to work with. The city doesn't engage in that process. That's up to the developer to select the contractors and design firms that they wish to work with. Now, if DMB had selected Story Living by Acme Design Services, it would have been a non-event. They didn't. They selected Story Living by Disney, the most prominent Imagineering organization on Earth. Now think about this. If you're a developer and you're looking for a design partner, wouldn't it be imagination that you would want as the key quality in the partner you select as your design partner? And so to circle back to uh, whether or not I'm irritated, <laughs> after uh, I looked at uh, the fact that there is an environmental impact report that anybody can review. 
there were full uh, uh, public uh, uh, procedures that took place right here in this chamber, I began to think that, well, maybe you did show me the room. And it's this front room. It's this council chamber. And this is where we have the debate. This is where we make our decisions. This is where we cast our votes in a fully public way with full and the full public process. Mr. Mayor, thank you for my time today. Thank you, Steve. That's very complete. And uh, yeah, it, uh, I, I personally have had experience with DMB uh, on the screen that you just showed there. One of the squares in the upper right-hand corner was a project that they did in Lake Tahoe called Lahontan. And if any of you have an opportunity to go to the screen that Steve just described, Take a look at this project. It is magnificent. It, it is so environmentally uh, compatible uh, with the area. And the Lake Tahoe area probably is one of the most environmentally difficult development uh, areas in the world. The Tahoe Regional Planning uh, Department is extremely rigid. And the DMB, you know, checked every box and did everything. It is now just a magnificent development, as will Section 31. It too, Katina, will be uh, magnificent. So thanks for clarifying that. And uh, uh, I feel badly about your anger, uh, <laughs> but uh, hopefully over time uh, th that will wane. Well, maybe if you ever take me off probation, you'll show me where that back room is really located. I would, it would be my pleasure, absolutely. Richard. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I have nothing to uh, present today, but in two weeks, I'm going to have a really exciting presentation. So I invite you all back for the next council meeting. And uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Richard. Well, your presentation last time was, you know, was so important regarding the Children's Discovery Museum, which is where you're spending a lot of your time. And so, uh, you know, we thank you for your effort there as well. Thank you. <clears throat> um, if you would, uh, Jason, put up the uh, Rancho Mirage resident golf court uh, sign, which is up. About uh, uh, seven or eight years ago, uh, Dana Hobart uh, and myself were, uh, frankly, uh, concerned about uh, the residents in Rancho Mirage uh, that uh, didn't belong to a private club and or uh, were not utilizing the club as much as they used to. So we thought it might be uh, advantageous for us to invest investigate uh, some arrangement with some of the local golf courses for specifically Rancho Mirage residents. How could we find, produce, and create another amenity for our residents? And we came up with the idea then uh, of an association uh, with several golf courses. Now, I must tell you that at the time, seven or eight years ago, uh, the golf courses uh, needed us uh, much more than they do today. Uh, golf has had a renaissance as a result of the pandemic. Uh, being an outdoor sport, uh, people have gravitated back to golf. Golf courses are full. Uh, most of the clubs have waiting lists. So the transition has been remarkable over the last uh, several years. But in any case, um, Gabe Cotting, our director of marketing, uh, has done the heavy lifting on this project. Gabe, great job. Uh, he has uh, negotiated uh, with the courses that are reflected on the screen here. And so, as a result, uh, Rancho Mirage residents uh, will have the opportunity to participate and play golf at Mission Hills North, which is the Gary Player course, the Rancho Los Palmas course, and the Desert Island course that short time ago was known as the S. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, to give you an idea of the economy and, frankly, the value uh, of this membership. Uh, and, and again, all you have to do is show evidence 
of being a Rancho Mirage resident, whether that be a utility bill or otherwise. That for $69 uh, annually, uh, you can uh, use and play at the three courses uh, that I just uh, pointed out to you. You can make a reservation three days in advance. The discount on the published rates at those courses will vary anywhere from 10 to 35 uh, percent discount off the, the rack rate. There will be a discount of 15 percent generally in the non-sale pro shop merchandise, and it includes a shared golf cart and practice range uh, balls on the day you play. It's terrific, particularly for uh, part-time residents in Rancho Mirage. Well, those that are here for six months or less, certainly Canadians fall into that category, but any part-time resident and or people that have belonged to private clubs and are no longer playing as much golf as they used to. Uh, instead of playing three or four days a week or five days a week, they play two days a week. And so they find that the uh, expense is impractical for them and therefore they're looking for another opportunity. And therefore we're pleased to be able to provide this opportunity for them. So again, uh, great, a great amenity, uh, great opportunity. Uh, we're pleased uh, to offer it. Gabe, good job. And thank you so much uh, for, uh, for the info and we look forward to our residents taking advantage of it. Uh, that concludes the uh, council comments. I'll ask the city manager if he has any comments. Yeah, I just wanted to confirm that uh, the instructions for participating remotely is on the face of the agenda and our Zoom link today is working just fine. And that's it, Mr. Mayor. Okay, I thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll now refer to the minutes of February 17th and I'll ask if there are any additions or corrections. If not, I'll ask for a motion to approve. Move to approve all the minutes. I'll second that. Uh, there's a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Uh, we will now go to the consent calendar and that will be handled by our city manager, Isaiah, if you would. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of the council, you have three items on your consent calendar for consideration. Item number one is the final acceptance of the Butler Abrams Trail Improvements City Project CP19-357. Item number two are contracts. Item number three are demands. And uh, that concludes the consent calendar. Christy, will you take any public comment on the consent calendar? Yes, I did not receive any speaker cards. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak regarding the consent calendar? Seeing none, if there's anyone participating remotely that would like to comment on the consent calendar, you can press star nine on your phone or hit raise hand on the Zoom screen. Give it a couple seconds. And I see no one raising their hand. All right, thank you very much. Is there any questions from council regarding the consent calendar? No. Uh, if there are no questions, I'll ask for a motion to approve the consent calendar. I'll make a motion to, uh, to uh, excuse me, I'll make a motion to accept the consent calendar. Second. There's a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. And the consent calendar is approved. Uh, the next night up will be the, um, again, the draft housing and safety element update to the general plan, and that will be handled by Jeremy Gleim, our uh, Director of Development uh, Services. Jeremy, if you would, please. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, Council. For your consideration today is the housing and safety element update to the city's general plan. Um, can we get the slideshow up, please? Thank you. This item was presented to the City Council at their last regular meeting on February 3rd, 2022, exactly one month ago, and was uh, continued at that meeting to today's meeting. So real quickly, uh, just some background on the housing element. Every city and county in California is required to adopt a general plan 
which serves as a visioning document for the development of that city or county. There are seven required elements that must be included in every city or county's general plan, uh, one of which is a housing element. And the purpose of the housing element is to provide both citizens and public officials with a comprehensive understanding of the housing needs within that city. The housing element is the only general plan element that requires updating on a regular basis, which is performed on an eight year cycle. Housing elements must be certified by the state and failure to achieve certification could lead to the state becoming the responsible implementing agency for that city or county's house, uh, housing element, excuse me. Um, and what that means is they would have the ultimate authority to change densities, development standards, uh, establish review process, uh, which also means that they could eliminate any and all public hearing requirements for individual housing projects. So that's the background without getting uh, too far into it again. So for this housing cycle, the city of Rancho Mirage was assigned 1,741 housing units. Um, the state has determined that the most appropriate density for the promotion of affordable housing development to be 30 dwelling units per acre. Through months of dialogue, we were able to prove that we could accommodate our assigned unit count without having to increase the base density of the existing high density res residential zone from nine dwelling units an acre to 30 dwelling units an acre. And that was due in part to the introduction of the affordable housing overlay. Absent the overlay, we would be required to increase the base density of our existing high density residential zone from nine dwelling units to acre uh, per acre to 30 dwelling units per acre, and that would be a citywide increase, not specific to any one site, just a, a citywide zoning update. The housing element by itself does not approve or authorize the construction of any development project. Rather, it provides the framework for future development and, that de and development that is consistent with state laws. All future projects will require processing through established procedures, including consideration by the Architectural Review Board and public hearings before the Planning Commission and City Council. So these next few slides will focus on the individual inventory sites that are listed in the updated housing element and the conditions surrounding them. Site A is a 36 acre property located just south of Rancho Mirage High School. This is a privately owned property with an existing zoning designation of high density residential. If the affordability overlay were to be assigned to this site, a developer would have the ability to maximize the density of 28 dwelling units per acre as a right of zone, increasing the potential unit count from roughly 400 units to more than 1,000 units on this site. Inventory site B is made up of approximately 50 acres of city owned land, half of which is designated high density residential and the other half which is designated as public park. The affordability overlay is assigned to the 25 acres that are zoned as high density residential, which has the potential to yield 625 units. The 25 acres zoned as public park is part of the parkland inventory in the city's general plan and is necessary acreage in the city's goal to achieve uh, three acres of parkland for every 1,000 residents. Inventory site C is comprised of the section 19 specific plan. As indicated by the dashed yellow line on the screen, there are three planning areas dedicated strictly to residential development within the specific plan. The balance of the specific plan is focused on commercial and mixed use development. The 22 acres of land dedicated to residential development already include densities of 25 dwelling units per acre, which are memorialized by Ordinance 1047 and which account for 553 units. Inventory Site D is the site of the former Rancho Palms Mobile Home Park. This property is owned by the City of Rancho Mirage Housing Authority, which is controlled by the, city, uh, the Rancho Mirage City Council. Because this is a housing authority site, it must be reserved for housing development. It cannot be converted to another land use. The state expects housing authority sites to promote affordable housing development, which is why the affordability overlay was assigned to the property. Being that the city's housing authority is the property owner, the city has the ultimate discretion as to the housing project that will eventually develop there. 
Inventory site E is a 13-acre site on Highway 111 that holds a mixed-use zoning designation. This property is located on the westernmost segment of Highway 111 and the border of Rancho Mirage and Cathedral City. As described in the specific plan, the vision for this property is to promote principles of mixed-use development with an emphasis on commercial retail development as the primary land use, with residential development as a secondary land use. The residential uses may be considered in the context of a larger comprehensively planned commercial development. The goal is to see this property developed with commercial uses. Inventory site F is a site on Highway 111 with an underlying commercial zoning designation. As mentioned with the previous slide, the primary land use for this site is commercial. However, residential uses may be considered in the context of a larger comprehensively planned mixed use development. Inventory site G is compri comprised partly of small privately owned parcels in the high density residential zone. Existing development in this area is comprised mostly of pre-incorporation structures. In total, there are approximately six acres of vacant land in this area, which are spread across 19 separate parcels, some of which are contiguous and some of which are not. All of these parcels are privately owned. The affordability overlay was assigned to this area because of existing zoning designations, existing development patterns, and land uses in the vicinity. Inventory site H fronts Highway 111 and has an underlying commercial zoning designation. The primary land use for this site is commercial. However, residential uses may be considered, again, in the context of a larger comprehensively planned mixed-use development. Inventory site I is made up of both pre- and post-incorporation structures with a handful of vacant parcels on non-contiguous lots. The primary land uses in this area are commercial, However, residential uses may be considered in certain locations where land use compatibilities are appropriate. So those are all of the inventory sites that were listed in the uh, housing element update. And so uh, there are two recommendations before you today. Uh, number one, the city staff recommends that the city council uphold the planning commission's recommendation to adopt resolution number 2022, next in line, amending the general plan to update the housing and safety elements with no changes. And the second recommendation in front of you for your consideration is that the city council direct staff to remove the affordability overlay from the former Rancho Palms mobile home park and or the Thunder Road area, assign it to inventory sites A, B, or E, and continue to work with consultants on the preparation and resubmittal for state review. Uh, that does conclude my presentation. Uh, staff and the consultant are available for questions, and thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Are there, um, are there any questions at this point that the council has? Any comments the council has? I will wait until we get further on. Okay. Thank you. Isaiah, do you care to make any comment at this point? Uh, no, let's go ahead and open up the uh, public testimony uh, period. So if any member of the public wishes to speak on this item, now is the time to do so. Uh, if you're participating remotely, uh, you would use the raise hand button on Zoom or star nine on your telephone. Uh, Christy, you want to take over the public comment from here? Yes, the first speaker is Mary Lou Souter. Hello, Mr. Mayor and council members. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I wanted to speak about housing because it di directly affects me and that I am a resident in Rancho Mirage Public Housing and uh, the affordable senior housing at Santa Rosa Villas. And I have experience um, doing some of my, the other things that I do in actually visiting and spending time in each of the four a senior affordable public housing that's currently available in Rancho Mirage. And what I wanted to point out, not so much to you because I know you're aware, but to the public, that these are lovely facilities. And right now you're faced with the, uh, hard decisions to make. And of course, uh, decisions are always difficult. 
and for the public, change is difficult. So as, as this progresses and as you make your decisions, um, I think it's important that the public has a chance to really go and look, if they want, at the existing senior housing that's available to see as an example of the product that the wonderful city of Rancho Mirage actually produces. So you know, look online, find out where the four different sites are, drive by, especially the uh, San Jacinto Villas. They're located um, right directly adjacent to the city park, and uh, they're two-story units. They're lovely. They're lovely small apartments, and there are some, a few casitas there as well. There are some one-bedroom and one two bed and some two-bedroom units available, and they're, 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 they have their own garages and carports um, available for guest parking, and it's just really, really lovely facility. So please take a look. And these are the kinds of things that the city of Rancho Mirage produces, and it's important to keep that in mind um, as, as this problem um, is in front of you. So um, I hope the public will take that into consideration and really uh, do, uh, do a little bit of a background check themselves and see what's out there. So uh, my hat's off to you. You have hard choices to make, and I thank you very much for all that you do especially for the seniors in Rancho Mirage. I personally am grateful, and I know all the people that I live near and around would be saying the same thing. So thank you kindly. Thank you, Mary Lou. Uh, yes, needless to say, we're all very proud of the buildings that we have. Uh, they are they're fabulous, and uh, it is the, you know, the style and dignity that we will maintain. Uh, and I hope that... Uh, our constituents have confidence in us that we will continue to do that. Uh, yes, uh, Christy, please. The next speaker is Jack Swenson. Mayor Weil, council members, my name is Jack Swenson. Been a 38 year uh, resident of Rancho Mirage, 15 years on Peterson Road and I spoke to this group uh, one month ago. Um, we are opposed to the overlay on both Site D and Site G, which is the Peterson Road and the uh, Thunder Road locations for a variety of reasons. I'm not gonna go into a lot of those reasons in my time, uh, but you've heard them before. We don't think it's appropriate for that kind of density 2,500 additional cars per day, uh, all the different things, possibilities of three and four story buildings, uh, we don't believe is appropriate in that location. But one of the things I mentioned before is what about the people living there, okay? What do they need, okay? And we're not against affordable housing. We think it's a, it's a very important thing. And in, in America, I believe in upward mobility, okay? What are we giving these people in these locations? They need jobs, they need education or better education for themselves and their children. They need affordable shopping and they need transportation. In those two locations, we got a bus stop, okay? But we don't have affordable shopping. It takes, it's eight hours, eight, excuse me, it's eight miles by car for me to go to the grocery store, okay? If you don't have transportation, how do you get affordable groceries? You walk down to Duke's and you got hardly anything to choose from at a high price. So when we look at what are alternatives, we sent a letter, Mike and I, to you city council members on alternative sites to look at. I don't believe they've been looked at properly. Okay, um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about those sites and why I think they're more suitable. Site A, which is the land south of Ranch Mirage High School, uh, there's 40 acres there. 25 acres could be used for uh, the overlay. That would bring in 700 units. The total of the five we're talking about are 3,256 units you need 1,741. So you don't need all these, okay? 
but why are these sites better for the people living there? Not just for us. What about them? Okay? And so if you're at that site, you're right next to the high school. What about education? What about adult education? What about improving their education? What about shopping, which is a lot closer? Transportation. It's a better site. And it's not in the overlay. The second site is site B, which is in the overlay. And site B is also city owned. And it's land section 30. And in that site, you've designated 25 acres out of 50. And another 25 that could be for park. Why not do 35 acres in a 15 acre park? Okay? That's 980 units. And where is that located? It's located, again, very close within walking distance. And think about walkability, okay, uh, of, would you, you know, kind of, the other items. Would you this start to the, wind up your comments a little bit? Pardon? Would you start to wind up your comments? Yes, I will. The last sites would be C, E, and the final site that's not been considered around Discovery Park. The total is 3,256 units. We believe they're all more suitable for the people living there. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Christine. The, the next speaker is Denise Roberge. Hello, Mayor Wheel. Um, I am not Denise Robert. I'm Catherine Swenson, and I live at 38590 Peterson Road. I'm speaking for myself and for Denise, because Denise um, had some coughing issues. Um, I want to make it very, very clear to anyone who's listening in that uh, in my little neighborhood, we are not opposed to affordable housing. As Mary Lou said, she uh, lives in a, uh, a planned community for seniors in an affordable housing community, and it's in our neighborhood. We have a very, very diverse, economically diverse neighborhood. The issue is, for all of us, is the density of the proposed project. And uh, also, I want you all to understand that Peterson Road dead ends. Uh, there is one entrance to it. And uh, Desert Cove, where Denise lives, dead ends. And Kelly Lane dead ends. It's a small, tight neighborhood. It's very peaceful. It's lovely. And as I said, very diverse. Uh, the issue that we're all concerned about is, of course, the amount of people in that neighborhood. And, and Mary Lou lives in an area where there are nine units, I believe, per acre. This proposal would be at least 30 units per acre and upwards of more because uh, the state has a possibility if the overlay is accepted to put 50% more units on top of that. Now, in our tiny little neighborhood, I can't tell you how difficult that would be as far as traffic, as far as, uh, you know, pe people come and love to walk on the Butler Trail. They're, they come with their dogs, they come with their families, and with the amount of people, with thousands of people entering into our little neighborhood, it would be a very difficult issue as far as traffic and access in and out of our small neighborhood because there are only two places to come in. One is Peterson, which I said dead ends, and the other is uh, Mirage Cove, which comes from off of one of 11. Um, we just can't even begin to imagine the amount of traffic that would incur. And, uh, and as my husband Jack said, it's a, it's a very poor walkable count there. People can't get to groceries. They can't get to jobs by walking. They can't do a lot of the things that they should be able to do easily. And uh, I think this just is probably not the area. I'm out of time. Oh, no, actually, I'm Denise also. <laughs>
Denise wanted me to say, to speak for her. And I'm looking at her notes here. Um, she said, the addition of approximately 600 cars turning off of Highway 111 will cause many traffic accidents and congestion. I know as I travel on this highway every day and I have made, uh, and I have to make a fast right turn in order not to, she says, wear the car behind me. <laughs> And I, I see what she means. It is, it is a very dangerous turnoff. The density that comes with the overlay zone does not fit in these areas. Most of us who bought and choose this neighborhood for its low density and privacy, it makes no sense to have all of the other empty lots further down Peterson zoned for one acre and then to overcrowd the upper portion of Peterson with housing at a density of 20, 28 plus units per acre and buildings that are three and four stories. And that's the other thing that, that I'm concerned about is with that density, there's no other option than to have three or four story buildings that would be big fingers in the sky. There are other locations that are far superior to you. Would you kindly, me. excuse me? Would you kindly wind, wind up your comments? I'm going to wind up, I'm almost done. Uh, and just reading from Denise's report, there are other locations that are far superior to use for this need. None of them affects any neighborhood, but this will very much affect our neighborhood. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your comments. Chrissy? The next speaker is Kay Williams. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council. My name is Kay Williams, and I also live on Peterson Road. I've been a 58-year resident of the area, and my husband and I built our home there about 21, 22 years ago. Um, I've written all of you in the past, so I don't want to go over other concerns that I've already addressed to you personally. Um, first of all, before I get onto this, I have to thank you for the new trash bins around the city, along the trails and the Whitewater Park. They are beautiful. And um, when I've been there using them, I hear other people commenting along the trails also. They, they, they definitely appreciate it. Also, I saw the mayor's kind of a newsletter on Facebook through Ranch Mirage. So I appreciate that kind of transparency that I think you were trying to work on. If you've written other ones before, I've never seen that before, but I did catch the last one. Um, I was here at the last meeting, and at the end of that last meeting, it seemed very positive that the staff was going to work with um, Mike Fontana and Jack Swenson on the alternative sites, and I was disheartened to hear recently that that did not occur. Um, kind of, my trust kind of went down with that. Um, also, I'd like it on record again, even though I've stated it in letters, that my husband and I are opposed to the locations, and I saw the two recommendations, and I hope you will definitely consider the second re recommendation of taking the mobile home park and the Thunder Road park out of the overlay. Um, not one or the other, but both, as I've read other comments that it can include both. Um, I was also going to state about the other um, senior housing. Yes, it's lovely. I walk my dogs by there almost every day, as do a lot of other people, and the density is quite different than what's being proposed. And any other time left, which is not very much, I give to Michael Fontana. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Jeffrey Jones. How do you do, Mayor, Council? My name is Jeffrey Jones. I'm a resident of Ranch Mara since 1998. I've been an interior designer and involved in design and construction in Ranch Mirage for 30 years. I've always been impressed by the parameters that you've set. Um, I have family members who live both on, I'm talking about a parcel G. I have uh, family on Estates Road and Bird Lane. 
I can only tell you that it's totally woefully inadequate in terms of parking as it is. The number of potential accidents that go on, the fact that um, visitors can't park as it is today, um, the gas station on the corner is heavily trafficked from 7 in the morning till 11 at night. Um, constantly, you hear the ambulances coming to that intersection where there's head-on collisions. I think it's a crazy idea. Moreover, from a design standpoint, the parcels along Thunder Road is very haphazard. They're older buildings. And I don't see how they could integrate sensitively new buildings, especially with the heights of three and four floors. And I might add, part of the joy of living up on that Thunder Road is the view. And that would obstruct my view, my family's view, and a lot of other people's view. And I uh, heard about this about 15 minutes before it started, but I wanted to come and, uh, from the small man's perspective, uh, give you my view. Thank you. Thank you. OK, other than Mike Fontana, is there anyone else in the audience who didn't put in a speak? <coughs> Go ahead. Please state your name for the record. Um, good afternoon, City Council, Mayor. I was horrified at what I heard about what's planned. I also know it's not the city, and it's not the state. I know it's the federal government. I live in Santa Rosa Villas, which is right there on Peterson. Um, we have the most beautiful little senior complex in Rancho Mirage, I truly believe. I live in a little single um, home. I'm not attached to anybody. My community is very, very quiet, and we are all seniors. Peterson Road, however, is very dangerous. People fly down Peterson Road, and as far as having the density that the government is insinuating we should have, what are you going to do? Take out part of blue skies to widen the road or take out part of that RV um, complex? It's right there on Peterson. You cannot get two, more than two cars beside on that road. When we come out Peterson and make a right or a left turn, that's it. I mean, you have one car going one way, one car going the other way. It is skinny. And also, have we forgotten or do we not remember the mobile home park and what it was like when when we had what I don't sorry I don't remember how many units were there but the parking on the street was horrendous there were cars up and down the street constantly I know this because I am a COP and I'm very aware of the situation when that park was actually in existence so I, I want to thank you in one way because you have given me the opportunity to live in such a beautiful home, and I truly mean that. I'm so proud of my home. But I'm scared to death at what could happen if we start building high rises on Peterson. And I'm, I would be so sorry for everybody who has these beautiful estates around. It simply isn't a, a good choice. It simply is not. Hopefully the one by the high school, to me, sounds wonderful. Also the other one. And um, I mimic all the other speakers that have felt the same as myself. Thank you very, very much. Thank you again for the house that I live in. Thank you. Ma'am, before you go, would you state your name for the record, please? I didn't do that. No. Oh, I'm Marilyn Arcoli Arcaroli. Thank and you. And I live on um, right off of Peterson Road. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Anyone else in the audience who did not submit a slip? OK, come on up. Uh, hi, I'm I need come you to up. come to the microphone and state your name. Sorry, thank you. Hi, I'm Laura Jessup. I live on Mirage Cove Drive. I think you've all gotten letters from me. I vote no to the overlay, yes to uh, moving to the high school or somewhere that actually makes sense. Um, and the rest of my time I'm giving to Mike Fontana, so you get that. Anyone else in the audience who didn't submit a slip? Okay, sir, come on up. Please state your name for the record. My name is Kevin Janier, J-E-N-N-I-E-R. And Shelly Janier, who's with me here today, is and I are residents of Thunderbird Villas. 
4150 Paseo Entrada. Thank you. And I'm here with uh, Marlene Foster, who is the president of the HOA board at Thunderbird Villas, and with uh, Larry Salt. Saltz, who is also on the board. And they've asked me to say a few words to them, and I'll be as brief as I possibly can. Um, Shelley and I have been residents of Rancho Mirage for about 40 years now. And um, I've had the pleasure of working with the Planning Commission and the City Council and the Construction Department uh, in the past. I have a planning and zoning and development background, at least enough to be dangerous. And uh, we've always been, we've enjoyed living in Rancho Mirage. And one of the things that's, that uh, has impressed me and is that as Rancho Mirage has developed, that the Planning Commission and the City Council have made sure that things were done correctly, that we things were done and that improved Rancho Mirage and didn't negatively affect what was already there. Uh, in this case, the residents of Thunderbird Villas are very concerned about this proposal, specifically uh, the Site G, which we understand is also called the Thunderbird, the Thunder Road parcel, and also Site D, which we know is across the uh, across 111 from us. But I'd like to also uh, um, say that we agree with the overall feeling that the, as relative to sites D, F, and G, the densities that would result would be way too high. The fact that the site that the site G is is up against immediately up against uh, the property line of Thunderbird Villas would have we feel disastrous effects from a noise visual. Uh, in traffic standpoints, we don't know how people would get in and out, and once they did, where they would go. And um, again, I think that Mike Fan Fontana will probably add to what I'm saying and to what everybody else has said, so I don't want to go on too long, but we would support uh, the proposal that we understand has apparently been made for sites G and D to be removed from the, uh, the plan. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else in the audience who did not submit a speaker card? Okay, then we'll move on to our remote audience. Um, again, if you're online and you wanna make comments, um, you or on the phone, you would push star nine on your phone or press raise hand on Zoom. The first speaker is Rob Bergstein. Rob Bergstein, resident of Magnesia Falls Cove. Um, I just wanted to express my concerns about sites D and G as well. And this is not NIMBYism um, on my part. Um, one of my proudest achievements was working on a redevelopment agency in a different municipality and building um, a couple of hundred permanent affordable housing. I'm very proud of that. I'm always in favor of building um, more affordable housing so that uh, communities can remain diverse. But in order to place the number of units that might be authorized on these lots, it's, it's not, it's gonna dramatically change the scope and the scale of these neighborhoods. Um, unless you're hoping for a developer to come in and build micro units, um, which would still increase the density beyond an acceptable amount, the buildings will have to go vertical, which as a prior speaker said, is going to um, completely alter um, the feel of the neighborhood, the character of the neighborhoods and uh, their views. Um, so I'm, I'm fully in favor of building uh, more housing and especially more affordable, permanent affordable housing, but have it to be compatible with the existing neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, it's just identified as Jim. Look, looks like you're still on mute if you're trying to speak. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, my name is Jim Walker. I am a resident over here on Desert Cove Avenue, uh, one of Mike Montana's neighbors. And I'm here to voice my concerns today uh, regarding the staff report uh, dated March 3rd uh, this year, uh, specifically regarding the proposals A and B I oppose a and I'm for B, as long as the word or is removed out of that paragraph to uh, avoid any confusion. Uh, I was at the last meeting and spoke as well, uh, going over a few of the points that I wanna talk about today is I'm not sure, unfortunately, that um, 
the mayor's uh, wishes, if I understood him correctly, at the last meeting were honored when we were told that uh, a representative, uh, Mike, would have a chance to, uh, to sit down and discuss some of the options uh, for this. It doesn't seem like that was honored. I'm not sure why. Uh, Mike's a very smart guy and his intentions are solid. So I think that that was um, a loss there. I'm also very concerned about the city's liability and safety issues regarding uh, this project. The, as you've heard from many of the speakers today, <clears throat> the intersection of the 111 and Peterson is already overweighted with the gas station and the mobile home parks there, the traffic, and again, the right turn problem coming into Peterson from the 111. Uh, I don't know how many times I was uh, <laughs> Uh, almost rear-ended uh, along with some uh, sign language given to me for trying to turn right there. And so it's a dangerous intersection as it is. There's always a lot of traffic crossing the street back and forth. So to add any kind of uh, high density housing on either side of the 111 there, I believe would be uh, very a, a very challenging thing for the city to deal with in the long term and possibly a, a major safety concern with the amount of uh, traffic going through that intersection. At the end of the day, whether I was a resident or not, um, I just believe that there's just way too much uh, weight on that intersection there to handle anything like this. And again, this is a very peaceful neighborhood. We had to um, deal with a lot in this neighborhood over the last years. So we're hoping the city can step up and make the right decision because I can tell you uh, from speaking from experience, um, stuff like this, once it gets done, is very hard to undo. Uh, it's like trying to take chlorine out of water. Once it's in there, it's very difficult to get out. If I have any additional time left, I would like to uh, give it to Mike Fontana. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Excuse me, the next speaker shows up as Lisa. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes. Hi there, I'm Lisa McFadden. I own seven acres on Kelly Lane and we've been residents here for over 50 years. And my dad served on the city council for many, many years. Maybe some of you know him. But anyway, I vehemently oppose the housing element overlay on the former Rancho Palms mobile home park and Thunder Road areas. And I give up my speaking time to Mike Fontana Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, that is the last person I see raising their hand remotely. So I'll call on Mike Fontana. So uh, Mike, just one second. Uh, Mike's gonna be our last speaker. So if you wanna speak on this item, this is your last opportunity. So we'll ask one more time for the in-person audience. You've already spoke, sir. You can't speak twice. Uh, anyone that hasn't spoken yet, do you want to make a comment? Can I ask a question? You, no. I will Christy, uh, we have a phone number online that wishes to make a comment. Like someone just raised their hand. Phone number ends with 1177. You can go ahead. You're on mute. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, Mr. Mayor and all, all uh, members of the council, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you for a moment here. My name is Paul Passera, the owner of Rancho Mirage RV in Mobile Village. I've listened intently to all, of the, all the folks that have expressed their opinions here. I must say that uh, I wholeheartedly agree I've surveyed uh, the vast majority of the 72 residents in my park, and uh, they also agree this would be a disaster. And uh, actually, that's really all I have to say. Everything has been very clearly stated by the other folks that have spoken, and I'd like to uh, remainder my time to Mike Fontana. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we had someone raise their hand, but it's no longer being raised. So, Mr. Fontana? All right. You'll be our last speaker today, Mike. Thank you. Right. 
Well, thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak with you today. Uh, with all that time that was given, I hope I don't have to use all of it. I will try and be concise and brief and to the point. It is really good, by the way, to see you all here uh, and not online and unmasked. Uh, and before I begin, I want to thank you for a couple of things. First of all, to continue this hearing and to give us some time. Secondly, uh, I want to thank you for the improvements that you've done to the Butler Avons Trail. Uh, we enjoy those almost daily, as do many of my neighbors and visitors. And then thirdly, I, I just want a little shout out to Marcus, uh, who has helped us uh, remove the overhead lines and poles on Peterson Road in front of the Rancho Palms Mobile Home Park. Uh, we discovered that uh, that had been paid for when you undergrounded all your other utilities. And now we're waiting for Spectrum and Frontier underground inside the park, or not underground, but remove the poles and the lines. So it was helpful. And I think you know, and I've told you this before, that one of the beautiful things about living in Rancho Mirage is being able to have this closeness with our council and our staff. So thank you for all that, and let me begin. So as you heard uh, from others, uh, and it's important, uh, that we're here today to ask that you approve the alternate motion B and remove the word or so that the overlay zone will be removed from both the former Rancho Palms Mobile Home Park and the Thunder Roads areas. Okay. We think that, um, okay, so we'll get back to this in a minute. At the February 3rd meeting, uh, staff was very concerned that the state could move in and take over your responsibilities to approve housing on land that's zoned uh, high density residential, of which these two parcels are. On February 14th, the Desert Sun ran an article on Riverside County's non-compliance with the housing element of their general plan. And there were two reasons really that they did. They didn't feel that they adequately assessed the housing needs, but more, they didn't feel that they had attracted enough public input. So um, the county, I think, is already in, in defective and they have to update their plan every four years. But what I thought was the most impressive thing about the article is that fewer than 10 of the nearly 200 jurisdictions in the Southern California Association of Governments sphere of influence are not in compliance. So. 190 of 200 missed the October 15th deadline to submit their plan. So we're in good company, and I think that other communities must be taking their time to make sure they get it right, just like you are. When, when I was a younger guy and I was starting my career, I had a problem, and I went to my boss, and who was a great mentor, and, and he didn't solve the problem for me, but he taught me something. He taught me to do the right thing, to do it the right way, and to do it for the right reason. Okay, and what I'm trying to tell you is that we're here to help you. We think that the housing element is currently drafted with respect to these two sites is the wrong thing in the wrong place for the wrong, wrong reason. Filling the state's quota is not the right reason to unleash that burden of 28 units per acre plus a 50% density bonus by right of zone, underline that. I'm sure Steve can tell you what right of zone means. It means you have the right to have 28 units. You don't have the right to bonus, but you can get it, maybe, okay? So that's why we think that it's the wrong thing in the wrong place for the wrong reason. Um, we don't have a two-story structure in our neighborhood. Um, we either have mobile homes, we have the senior complex, Santa Rosa, and when you go over the fence from the mobile home park, everything's zoned one unit per acre. Uh, when I was a young planner and I was learning that trade, uh, we learned that the ideal situation is to create smoothness among the gradients, not harsh and abrupt uh, conflicts between uses. If you have one dwelling unit per acre here, maybe you'd have two dwelling units per acre here, maybe you've had 
four here, maybe you'd have duplexes, maybe you'd have multifamily, and you'd have this smooth gradient, not an abrupt gradient. You don't put a slaughterhouse next to a single family development. You don't put a, a, a auto mechanic shop next to a single family development, and you don't put multifamily next to a single family development. Now, uh, when I began uh, learning about the Rancher Mirage Mobile Home Park, that was 18 years ago, and that's when I moved here. And in 2009, I believe it was, the city started to acquire it. And I inquired, as did my neighbors. And what we were told is that the plan was, and it was a great plan, was to take Santa Rosa, which is single story, detached, senior housing, and expand it into the old mobile home park. Now, unfortunately, the RDA funds were absconded with by the state. They should give them back, by the way. Um, but they took that money and it made the project um, infeasible at the time. Now, I don't think you've heard one comment here from anybody that's spoken against the housing element about low and moderate income housing. We know we need it. We've spoke, not spoken against it. Our issue has been the density. Um, we think that if you have the ability, um, expand Santa Rosa. Uh, develop it at one acre to nine units. Uh, you won't receive an objection from us. We, we'd sure like to see the plans and comment and be involved on the front end, but, but we're not opposed to that. Uh, the density at nine uh, units per acre, nor being low and moderate income housing. Um, and it's a better fit. Okay. I, um, I sent a handout to you today. Um, I wanted to show it on the screen, but I guess that's kind of hard to do. But if you could follow along with me with the handout, um, it looks something like this. Okay, and I know you can't see it at home. But the, the reason I did the handout is that 28's a number. Okay, what's 28 mean when you do 28 units per acre? What's that look like? It's kind of hard to visualize if you're not in the business or visually oriented to it. But 28 units is a lot of density. Okay, it's urban density. This is, this is from uh, a, a project in Palm Desert. Um, this project is being developed at 21.4 units per acre. Okay, the building height is 40 feet. It is a project that consists of three and four, or excuse me, two and three story buildings. But this is really hard to read because it's such small scale. If we could have had it on the big screen, I could explain it a little better. But what you're seeing is um, two and three story buildings that are 20 feet apart, okay? And to make their parking requirements work, they parked it at 1.84 spaces per unit. So what you've got is a sea of buildings 20 feet apart. Okay, there's a sidewalk in the middle that's five feet. Leave seven feet on of green space between the buildings. I'm not sure what you grow there. Okay, but when you are on your patio, you've got 20 feet to the next patio. It, it, it really is harsh, and this is at 21 units per acre. It's not 28. So what I think you would expect to see when you do 28 units per acre is you're going to see three and maybe even four story buildings, especially to get in the parking requirements in the open space that our zoning ordinance requires. So the last page that I included here is this. And, and this is the plat map from uh, Thunder Road. And the area at the bottom that's shaded, uh, those are eight separate lots that were sold as a unit um, that are narrow and long. You can see that they're long. Um, the Thunderbird Villas sits right here across from them. Um, if we were to grant the overlay zone to the Thunder Road area tomorrow, that developer could come in and ask for 28 units because it's by right of zone. You don't have discretion over it. It's by right of zone, and, and, and there are things that, that affect you when it's by right of zone. And I would think that the Thunderbird Villas would start to see four-story buildings going up right on 
the perimeter of their property. And I know you don't want that, and they don't want that, and I don't want that. And I think it's a bad fit for the city, and it's the wrong thing in the wrong place for the wrong reason. Now, let's say you do. Let's say you take Thunder Road. Let's say you take the Rancho Palms Mobile Home Park and you decide that you're going to put the overlays on it. But because you own the Rancho Mirage Mobile Home Park, you feel like you are confident that you can handle the development and that you can control what the development is going to be like. And to a certain degree, you can. Okay? But you got a problem. You got a problem called Senate Bill 166. And Senate Bill 166 says that once you do this, that the law prohibits the city, county, or the city and county from reducing or permitting the reduction of the residential density to a lower density without substantial evidence and without replacing the units elsewhere. So once you get 28, if you go nine, once you designate it with the overlay and you go nine, you gotta make up the difference somewhere else. Okay, so we're just asking you to make up the difference today and not go through that pain. Here's the other piece. If you overlay it, and it's 28 units per acre, and you decide that you've got to meet the open space requirements, you've got to meet the height requirements, you've got to meet the parking requirements, you've got to meet the setback requirements, then you have to deal with Senate Bill 330. And Senate Bill 330 says, the act requires a court to impose a fine on a local agency under certain circumstances and requires a fine of at least $10,000 per housing unit in the housing development project on the date the application was deemed complete. So, you know, I guess we're just trying to say, why do the overlay zone when the overlay zone is opposed by so many residents, when it's a bad fit in our neighborhoods, when it's a problem for you down the road to change, and if you don't change it and somebody tries to develop it, but the development standards preclude them from receiving 28, you expose yourself to a financial problem. And, and so, you know, we're here to help. Um, we talked about alternative sites, and I'm going to go to one of them right now um, because I'm going to read to you from the master plan, the specific plan for Section 19. Section 19 is the site that I think it was called. What's, what's Section 19 called, Jeremy? Uh, that's C. That's C. Okay, so C. So see, I think we had that at uh, 25 units per acre in the specific plan. So this is, they call it planning area 4.01-03. And it says a maximum of five, it says that there are, um, hang on, um, a maximum of 558 units could be constructed at densities reaching 28 units per acre in buildings ranging from three to four story in height. So, you know, I'm not selling you a, a, a bag of beans here. They will be three and four stories in height. But the inclusion, if you include affordable housing, it would increase the allowable density to 36 units per acre. So what we're trying to tell you is that is a viable site for the overlay zone where you can get affordable housing at 28 units per acre and not have an impact onto an established residential neighborhood. You have a better fit in a better area. The high school, high school, I, I believe somebody said 40 acres, I think it's 36. Correct. Um, you don't have to use all 36 to meet your quota. You could have some of it be uh, high density with the overlay zone and some of it not be, and it could be mixed up. As a matter of fact, if it were done properly, uh, with kind of a master plan to it, it might be a nice little community uh, with a variety of densities in it, as could the city-owned piece at the dog park. So I guess to sum it up, um, you do have alternatives. You do have choices. You can keep the um, Rancho Palms Mobile Home Park as um, affordable housing at nine units per acre and remove the overlay zone, we don't have a problem with that. And the same thing with Thunder Road. I don't think Thunder Road has a problem with being at nine units per acre, but you can take that density that these two sites had and you've got opportunities to shift them. Uh, you do have, and, and, and I think the mixed use development on the parcel across from Motel 6 has potential. 
we, we just never got to discuss it with anybody. I think the high school shows potential. I think the parcel on section 19 shows potential. And I think the parcel uh, that you have um, that is behind the dog park uh, doesn't necessarily need to be 25 and 25. It could be, you know, 35 and 15 and you'd still have park and you'd have housing. So again, we're here to ask that you consider alternate B, you remove or you remove the overlay zone from both the um, Rancho Palms Mobile Home Park and the Thunder Road area and you do the right thing the right way for the right reason. Thank you. I am here if you want to discuss anything or have any questions for me. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, we have a uh, five minutes. Certainly. All right. Uh, five or ten minutes. Take a ten minute restroom break and come yeah. back. We're going to take a ten minute break and then we'll be back.
Do we want to start out with council? Or do you want to? All right, we are back in uh, session. Uh, we are continuing uh, the uh, draft housing and safety uh, element update. And um, I will be calling on council comments as well as our city manager or any members of staff. Uh, to begin, I'll ask the city manager if he would like to make some comments. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first, I wanted to uh, thank everyone who uh, came here today uh, to uh, voice their concerns with the project. Um, you know, as we stated in the previous meeting, uh, affordable housing is a very important part of community planning. Um, and it's something that we have an obligation uh, to do, and we have to do it within state law. Um, you know, would, would staff be bringing forward, you know, 30 units to the acre if we weren't required to by the state of California? Um, no. Uh, as you've heard me voice many times uh, from this seat, you know, it seems like more and more when the state does things, they uh, take this one-size-fits-all approach, and they're really thinking of more urbanized areas like the Bay Area uh, or maybe L.A. where land is limited. Uh, they don't take into account... Um, our available land, our low density land use patterns out here in the desert, and just frankly, you don't see a lot of height out here. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, we don't have the luxury um, of saying that we don't want 30 units per acre. Uh, the state is requiring that of us. What we're talking about today and what you heard today uh, was where's the most appropriate place to put this uh, within our community. And there's several important factors, uh, one being that if our housing element is not approved by the state, uh, they will require us to default all of our nine units per acre to 30, every single site, uh, including the sites of um, question uh, that we've heard today. Uh, so it's incumbent upon all of us to find that solution uh, that is a tough situation that the state handed down to us, but also meets the state requirement because uh, frankly, we don't want all nine units to the acre going to 30. Um, and so the reason that uh, from the start of this process, that was the initial requirement from the state. And through a year of going back and forth with the state, uh, we were able to successfully um, demonstrate uh, with the affordability overlay, how we could uh, meet the allocation of housing units that uh, were being assigned to Rancho Mirage um, without changing everything, uh, just defaulting all of our nine units to acre to 30 units per acre. And uh, it's been a long road. Uh, it's been a difficult one. I uh, don't envy your guys' position because this is... Um, a tough one uh, for cities like ours that have the available land and you don't see a lot of height then. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to, um, you know, other than meeting law, uh, that we, the state is requiring us to do um, is, you know, we, we looked at a couple other sites um, for overlays. I know it was brought up by one of the speakers uh, in section 19, uh, inventory site C. And uh, so those units, the state at the beginning didn't even want to let us count those units that are there because they deemed that the um, probability of development is very low. Uh, so we had to argue just to even include uh, those numbers uh, within uh, our allocations with them. Um, and so those housing units are already included, so shifting the, the overlay to that actually would be a net loss of units and wouldn't do anything for us. Um, and then, you know, something that we um, at a staff level talked about is the state has taken away uh, the council's land use discretion um, when it comes to this plan and the 30 units per acre. 
you no longer have the ability at the local level to say that density is not appropriate for our city. Um, so when we were looking at the various inventory sites, um, we were required by the state to um, put in and basically account for a diversion of units. So they do not want you to segregate affordable housing uh, within your city to say the north end of your city. Uh, they really want to see sites throughout your city. Uh, so that's an important requirement that we need to keep in mind and that we have to meet. At the end of the day, if the state doesn't approve this plan, um, they're going to come back and require all of our nines to go to 30. Um, so, you know, it's, I appreciate the comments from the residents. You know, you have a right to um, be concerned. Um, so this is no, there's no criticism of your comments. And, you know, from my perspective, definitely didn't take it as um, negative towards affordable housing or nimbyism. This is just part of the public process where people have a concern for their residential neighborhood, which is completely appropriate. So thank you for sharing those thoughts. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do with this plan was um, utilize, since you're the council's land use discretion was removed by the state. Um, we wanted to be able to utilize your landowner discretion. And so one of the things that we've talked about is there's uh, two sites in the current plan uh, up by the dog park. Um, and then let's take the uh, old mobile home park site. Um, you know, when you look at those two sites, uh, they're very different and they would develop very different. So up by the dog park, there's not a whole lot of development around it. It's pretty wide open spaces. Uh, you have some pretty big commercial buildings around there um, adjacent to major regional roads. So, you know, that's city owned property. So, you know, if somebody came in and wanted the city land and they were proposing a project, that, that could be a site that you could see develop with some height. Four stories, probably not, but you know, you could get a couple stories there and be okay. Um, versus the old mobile home site, again, still our land. So if somebody was proposing a project uh, that we didn't feel was appropriate for that area, uh, at the end of the day, it's your landowner discretion that you would utilize uh, to say that's not an appropriate project. Um, that site, obviously, due to the condition of it, um, you know, is very different than the dog park site. So by placing these overlays on city-owned land, um, we wanted to basically give the council the most control during the process and discretion. And uh, at the end of the day, we will analyze impacts to projects uh, when they flow through the process. Uh, so they're going to uh, meet standards, uh, consider impacts, and do things like that. And any potential project, you know, there's no project being discussed here today. Uh, these are, this is a policy. And so any future project that wanted to come through is going to go through the entitlement process. Uh, and so that entails public hearing notices to adjacent neighbors, public input, and the city can consider factors through that process um, as a project gets proposed. Um, so, Jeremy, I don't know if you want to uh, add anything before um, we turn it back over to the council. Uh, just read it, read it, read the fact that... Um Specifically, Site C, that was mentioned, the Section 19 specific plan. Uh, there are inherent challenges um, due to lack of in infrastructure out there that would uh, make it difficult or, or just more challenging to develop there. So uh, the state does look at those factors when they look at the housing element. They look at the sites, and they do analyze the probability of development there. Uh, and like Isaiah said, they look at concentrations of units in certain uh, areas of the city. Uh, so I think those are good points to keep in mind. And also, they do look at housing authority sites, and um, they consider those um, basically ripe for housing development and sites that should promote the development of housing. So, um, again, they've determined the, the base density for affordable housing development to be 30 dwelling units per acre. Um, so if the overlay is taken away from there and you know they're gonna they're gonna view that as us not being um 
pro housing development on a site that is a housing authority site that is reserved for housing development. Um, so by virtue of removing the overlay and decreasing densities there, it's just going to it's just going to come up on their radar. So I just wanted to make those points and uh, thank you for the consideration. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, Steve, would you like to make a comment, please? Yeah, I'd just like to add a little bit of perspective from um, a legal perspective. So the, the city of Rancho Mirage, like you know, all other cities in the state, are you know we're tasked with adopting policies, including zoning ordinances, that will help the city meet its uh, the statutory the state requirements for of providing its fair share of housing for a region, uh, for this region, and and that's determined by um, the that's been determined by the recent regional housing needs assessment. That's where we get this term RENA. Um, so what RENA is mandated by state housing law. And it's a part of this periodic process of updating our local housing elements. So every city has to, on a periodic basis, um, update their local housing elements of their general plan, which is exactly what we're doing. And every city in the state has to do this. Uh, RENA quantifies the need for housing within each jurisdiction during specified planning periods. I mean, that's the mandate. And so it's the Southern California Association of Governments. Um, that's a joint powers authority that was established under state law. That's an association of all these local governments and agencies that convene um, as a forum to address regional issues, primarily housing issues. And so we call that SCAG, the Southern California Association of Governments. And the SCAG region encompasses about, uh, I think, six counties, Imperial, Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino, and Ventura. San Diego has its own. And it includes 191 cities um, that include the city of Rancho Mirage. And it covers an area of more than 38,000 square miles and include more than 19 million inhabitants. And I think it's important to note because that's how they come up with these numbers. And that's how they're distributing these numbers uh, amongst these 191 cities uh, with a population of 19 million residents. So uh, what SCAG does is it develops these, uh, in addition to developing these, uh, these arena numbers, it develops all these long range, regional transportation plans, transportation improvement programs, air quality management plans. And they all try to make those all internally consistent with one another. So when they come up with these numbers that they assign to each of the cities, they take into consideration all of those plans and trying to come up with all these different plans and these programs and these policies and goals that are all internally consistent. So Skaggs just recently completed the process of developing, I think it's a six cycle, the RENA allocation plan. And that covers the planning period between October 2021 through October 2029. And this recent cycle, um, has been approved by the State Housing Department and um, Department of Housing and Community Development. And so that mandates that the city of Rancho Mirage, just like every other city in the state, they set a number of an addition, they come up with a set number of additional housing units in all categories, all income category, categories, which include very low income, low income, moderate income, and above moderate income. So communities have to use these um, RENA numbers in, in all of our land use planning, in prior to, prior, um, prioritizing our local resource allocation of you know, everything that we provide to the public. And we have to use these numbers to identify future housing needs resulting from, not, you know, from our population growth, our employment growth, and our household growth. And so RENA's not intended to encourage or to promote growth. It's simply, uh, you know, it's a, it's a number or a goal that allows us to anticipate growth. So these numbers that we're throwing out there, or you know, that we've established, that have been imposed on us, they're intended to help us anticipate the growth and plan for that growth. And, and, and the purpose of that is that we're supposed to use these goals and, these, and, all, and all these planning goals and objectives that are set forth in our housing element for the purpose of enhancing the quality of life in the community and 
improving access to jobs, promoting transportation mobility, and just as importantly to the state, addressing social equity and fair share in housing needs. So in summary, and since SCAG distributes a share of the region's housing needs to each city, the city has to go through what we're going through and what every other city is going through right now with respect to updating its housing element. And, 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 and what we're doing today and what we've been doing is that we're just trying to show where the locations are best where we can put these housing, I mean, the, you meet our housing needs or meet our housing goals. And that's what we're doing today. And this is not intended to be any commentary on what I've heard today. You know, this is just part of the process. And so I just wanted to add that perspective. And I know that the staff has clearly explained that this is being imposed on us by the state. And frankly, it is. But one of the things I just want to reemphasize is that what the city manager mentioned, when we do come forward with projects for any of these parcels that we're talking about tonight, there's going to be full public participation provided. There are going to be public hearing notices. It's going to go through our planning commission. Um, some of these may be going through our housing commission as well. And those, those, two or, those two commissions will be making recommendations to this council. But along each step of the way, the public will be notified of any proposed housing project, whether it's a low moderate income housing project or whether it's a you know, higher income housing project. We will have that opportunity. So what, whatever is decided today by the city council with respect to our housing element, just keep in mind that we're talking about goals and objectives, and we are not talking specifically about a particular housing project. But I do understand that there are concerns, and there are concerns in every community whenever there is any high-density housing proposed. But again, I, this is not intended to be any commentary on any of the comments that or input that we've received today, but I just wanted to add that perspective to why we're here today. Thanks, Steve. Um, and, and that's a good overview uh, regarding the, the situation. Um, Charlie, do you have any comments that you'd like to make? Yes, I, I will. And uh, <clears throat> this uh, week, the Desert Sun wrote a wonderful article, and they explained both sides of the story, which I commend them for. They really listed the yin and the yang of it. And I looked at that article and I went through <clears throat> a few things that I picked out, and I try not to have repetition here, but what Steve said, what everybody has said here on the panel, this is the intent to meet and have a program which would be approved by the state. And I'll go through a few of these little points that I had down here, and all of which we know, but all of which have made me look at how I would make my decision listening to all of you, listening to everything that you have heard here and this is not being rammed down your throats or our throats. One of the things in the article said, housing needs are determined by the state. We know that. It's all been discussed here. Staff identified seven of the sites. We know that. And the combination of city-owned land existing for high-density residential is in the program. However, if we did not do anything or change anything, the state decides Rancho Mirage hasn't done enough to bring more affordable housing to the city, and it can take control, and it can take control, and it can take control. That really hit me. Uh, I don't see how anybody can disagree with that. That's what it will do. 
they would have the ability of the state to decertify our plan and then developers would go to the state and there would be no inclusion of staff members, planning commission of the city, the city council in the decisions on products. Projects would be approved on some state desk with no review, no consideration of impacts by somebody who doesn't even live here or understand our community. So the consequences of us trying to change anything on what was presented here by staff and what has been said by all of us is very scary and it's not minor. But the state has put Rancho Mirage and other cities in a difficult situation of having to identify sites of potential affordable housing developments. The bottom line is from what has been said and what would be happening here, and hopefully we all understand it. Any changes to the housing elements will require it to be resubmitted for state review, which could take at least 60 days. If the state does not approve the changes, Rancho Mirage may be required to plan for higher densities across the board. You know, I, I, I can't elaborate anything more than what was said here by uh, Isaiah, by Ted, by um, all of you who have come to the podium, but mainly what Steve just said. I just wanted to reiterate to all of you that we do listen, we do read, uh, we don't do things in the back room. It's all above board. And it is all the city of Rancho Mirage. Rancho Mirage, as was said here by our charming lady, builds wonderful developments when and if in the next nine years they do come to, as was said, the planning commission, the city council, the review boards or whatever. We do have the power. Messing with this would destroy that power and take away everything from all of you. So um, that's my thoughts on it. That's how I look at it. And uh, I think you're going to hear some more um, comments that really have, not, it's not about you. It's not about us. It's about the city of Rancho Mirage. It's about the future of the city, the look of the city. And I can tell you by this council here today, as long as we're here, it will not be abused or used or destroyed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, well expressed, obviously. We all endorse that. Iris? I'll hold my comments until the end. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Steve? So um, our planning department uh, and Jeremy uh, has been working with uh, the California Housing and Community Develop, Development, Development Authority on this project for a long time. And Jeremy, I think it's probably safe to say that you have reviewed every single potential parcel in this city to figure out uh, what could or couldn't be included in this overlay and how HCD might review anything we do uh, in establishing a housing element. And I think it's probably safe to say that you've already taken into account just about every comment that people have made here today. Is, is that pretty accurate? Yes. Uh, and I think it's probably pretty safe to say that um, of uh, every person, not only in this council chamber today, but in the city of Rancho Mirage, you're the guy who really knows where these parcels are located. Hmm. You're the guy who really understands what the state might or might not do. Uh, and you're the guy who really understands how, what kind of flexibility staff needs in order to respond to development requests in the future about affordable housing. I think that's probably pretty safe to say too. So 
The Regional Housing Needs Authority mandated, mandated that the city identify sites where a minimum of 1,741 affordable housing units might be built between now and year end 2029. Staff is recommending a larger number so that you have adequate flexibility in reviewing applications and compliance with HCD requirements. It doesn't mean that you're gonna approve uh, up to 2,300 units. It means that you want the flexibility so that you can attempt to distribute affordable housing where, uh, where it's appropriate in this city. And the city isn't responsible for assuring that anything is built, as several of us have already said. The city is simply responsible for making sure that the opportunities exist. And am I correct that HCD requires sites be identified in a way so affordable housing parcels are sprinkled throughout the city in some fair and equitable fashion, meaning the state won't approve a plan that concentrates affordable housing on just two, three, or four parcels. Isn't that right? Correct, if they're all located in the same vicinity. Yes. Right. So staff has no choice but to submit a plan that represents a mix of housing types spread through the city. Um, and you've got no choice uh, in identifying sites where more than 1,741 affordable housing units can be built so that you've got the flexibility to react appropriately in the future. Um, I think it's also the case that uh, this plan doesn't automatically approve any development. We've already talked about that. Steve talked about it. Uh, any application from any developer still must go through the entire review process. Planning Department review, ARB, Planning Commission, City Council, we're all going to be in this room one more time when uh, any developer asks to develop any of these parcels. Isn't that right? Yes. We're going to be here again. It's going to happen all over again. So with resp respect to the parcels identified with the exception of B&D, uh, if a developer submits an application, we've got no ability to deny density up to 28 density, uh, 28 uh, uh, units per acre, correct? But with respect to B&D, we do have some flexibility, as Isaiah talked about. So one more question regarding Assembly Bill 72. If the state finds that we aren't making a, a adequate progress with HCD, the state has the right to decertify our housing element, which would mean that HCD would take over our entire planning and approval process. There would be no public hearings like this. HCD would dictate where and how affordable housing is built, and they could do it in any part of the city, not just these parcels we're talking about today, but everywhere. Isn't that right? That is a potential result of decertification, yes. Okay. All right, so, and I believe that uh, staff has already negotiated some form of pre-approval with HCD, and if this plan is approved today, HCD has 60 days, a uh, 60 day time frame in which to respond. That doesn't mean that approval is guaranteed, but it does mean that you have some comfort that there's finally an end of the day in this HCD process. Isn't that right? Yes, we've responded to all the comments that we have received to date, and the state already has those, and, and are reflected in this plan, yes. Okay, so you've completely reviewed this with the state and you're waiting to hopefully get to the end of the day at this process. And if a plan isn't approved today, council sends us back to the drawing board, it'll be some months until there's another plan in place. And there is no reason to feel comfortable that HCD will feel any more comfortable with this plan versus any future plan. But the issue is they've already pre-approved this plan, correct? They have provided comments on what we've presented to you and we feel that we've adequately addressed every one of their comments with this plan, yes. Okay. So I don't have any doubt that staff believes that the, the submitted plan is in the best interest of the city and that you've diligently reviewed every possible alternative. But just to be doubly sure, you believe that this plan gives staff the flexibility needed to number one, comply with, might, might, with might, what might be described as draconian rules and regulations from HCD, number two, to deal with potential and entitlement applications from developers. Number three, to juggle as best you can approval of projects on some fair and equitable spread throughout the city. And number four, this is important, to deal with applications submitted on parcels B and D, which are owned by the city. And number five, protect the interest of the public through a full and complete entitlement approval process that must come with any future entitlement application. Is that a fair assessment of your goals? in presenting this staff report? Yes. Okay. There's no easy answers here today. Whatever this council does, uh, we're in a tight spot. We're pressed on the one, one side by the state, we're pressed on the other side by well-intentioned, 
people in this city who have every right to express their opinions on what we're going to do and what uh, and what uh, how we zone. Uh, every council member would be much happier if we didn't have to deal with this issue today, but deal with it we must. So we'll just have to steel ourselves to the social media bashing that is sure to come no matter what we decide. That said, we'll have to make a decision that I know every one of us will decide in a way that we believe is in the best interests of the people in the city of Rancho Mirage. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Steve. I, you, you, you summed it up very well, and you also reflected uh, not our, only our obligation, but our, our dedication our, our, and our creed, which is uh, what is best for the entire city. So thank you. Richard? Thank you, Mayor. Um, Jeremy, could you take a look at the recommendations that staff is making, uh, which were on page 4-1 of the report? And could you give us an opportunity to hear what is included in number B as opposed to what was the original proposal in number A? So just the difference between the two recommendations? Please. Yeah, so to summarize, uh, the first recommendation is staff's recommendation that the plan be approved pursuant to the Planning Commission's recommendation uh, with no changes to the element. Uh, and the alternative recommendation would be um, simply that the City Council direct us to remove the affordability overlay that was assigned to um, either the former Rancho Palm site, which is site D, uh, and or uh, the Thunder Road area, which is site uh, G. Um, those are two separate locations, two separate sites. So that's why we included the language and or, because they're not connected in any way, and simply direct us to assign that overlay to another site. So this includes A, B, and E? Correct. So looking at the number of units that each one of these now possesses or will in the future, what's, what are the total number of sites that we're looking at in the future? Well, all of the sites are in the inventory. Okay. So, uh, I mean, this wouldn't effectively remove any inventory sites. It would just reassign densities elsewhere. Okay. So, so basically, we're staying with the same locations that were the original proposal? Yes. Okay, and is there anything that's not included in item B that might want to be to change the, uh, the overall mix? I mean, these are staff's recommendations. If the council has other sites that they would rather see something assigned to, they're, you're welcome to, uh, to identify those. Okay, well, good. Well, it's, it was really um, important to read through the site locations and the number of, uh, of, of you know, sites that would be impacted. Um, just looking at the future of what we're talking about here, certainly uh, I don't think any of us want to take the kind of risk that could possibly be associated with this future development phase. Uh, there's not one of us that wants to say that project uh, is going to stay in the, uh, in the total package. But we do not, as a council, at least I believe we don't, want to put forth a project that is going to have a negative impact on our city in the future. Somebody mentioned, you know, the, the way that this city has been developed over the years. And it's a quality of life is really what we all focus on. And even though there are certain sites that could be developed, I, I just believe in my heart that we do a better job than the state of California would do in the development of various sites. And we can approve a project where the city would be uh, next in line to the state of California or we can develop sites that meet Rancho Mirage needs and, and our people that live here and why people came here to 
spend the rest of their lives in most cases. Rancho Mirage is unique, and we can't afford to let uh, some direction uh, go forward that doesn't protect all of our citizens and the general population of Rancho Mirage. Steve uh, spent uh, a few minutes talking about the opportunities there. Charlie, I'm sure, uh, did the same, and Iris is saving the best for last. <laughs> but uh, I think we just have to remember that what we're doing is in the best interest of Rancho Mirage. And when you put it all together, it's gonna be that way. We are not taking the risk that I think we would have if we moved into a, a different layout and plan. So at this time, uh, I think, uh, turn it over to Iris. Uh, but uh, I think all of us have come to the agreement that we've looked at every possible opportunity out there. And the one that is best for Rancho Mirage is item A. And I hope we'll all support that uh, tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, yes, um, I, so many comments were made today, both from our um, audience and homeowners and from our uh, panel here and from Isaiah and from Steve Q. Um, there are no easy answers to this. And the, one of the great things is that all these things will go through an entitlement process. The fact that the state is looking at every site and they're insisting that uh, all these uh, housing projects be spread out uh, and they're distributed appropriately. Um, and that the fact that the staff has already reviewed every uh, property available, um, we run the risk of, of having the state decertify if we don't comply with certain things and then they require us to uh, go by the standards that they deem appropriate uh, for their density. Um, there will be no public hearings as has been stated a couple of times and they take away essentially any city control. So as everyone has said, um, this is a very difficult situation. It has been thrust upon every city and we're all working the best way we can to do the very best. You know, we all up here especially take our jobs very seriously. We all live in Rancho Mirage and we all take, we hear what you say and we wanna do the best thing as the oath we have taken to provide the best lifestyle possible and that's what we're hoping to do every day that we sit on this dais and every day we come to work. So um, I, I think that uh, everyone has stated very well that we don't have a whole lot of choices in this matter. And um, I thank everyone for speaking and I think, thank everyone for coming this, and speaking as homeowners. Our heart goes out to you and our heart goes out to every resident of Rancho Mirage uh, that might be affected um, and, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do everything possible uh, to, to make the best of this situation. So thank you so much, Ted. Thank you, Iris. Uh, before, I, uh, before I call for a motion on one of these recommendations, I'll merely make a comment and it will be redundant because it's now been expressed by a number of people that uh, we've heard comments uh, from the homeowners that live in the area. And incidentally, if I lived in the area, I would be taking a similar position. But we hear about how incompatible a three and four story building would be and how the density would impact the streets, the hazard as far as traffic is concerned, and so forth. Now again, as I say, to the point of redundancy, we have not discussed, nor have we seen, 
any specific projects that have been brought forward that would be developed on any of these sites. And once again, when that occurs, that will be reviewed by the planning department, architectural review board, city council. All of that will have 100% total participation by you, the homeowners, the public, and anyone that has an interest, but it will be total transparency. So although, again, should, should a decision be made today contrary to what your own recommendation is, you have to have some confidence that this city council and any other city council, hopefully, that follows us, is going to follow the same stringent guidelines that we have used, which is to protect the lifestyle and interest of our residents. That is our mandate, and we will continue to pursue that. That being said, uh, I have now heard comments from all of my colleagues, from council, from staff, and I'll ask for a motion to approve either A or B at this time. Is there someone that would like to make a motion? I will, Mr. Mayor, if I may. All right, Charlie. I will state that the city staff recommended that the city council uphold the planning commission's recommendation for adoption resolution number 2022 next in line amending the general plan to update the housing and safety elements with no changes and that's number a i'll second all right there's a motion and a second for Recommendation A, and I will call for a vote on that. Motion carries 5-0. All right, I thank you, and, and thank you. This is a very difficult decision. I know that uh, a number of you out there are disappointed, but on the other hand, uh, I hope you understand that we're doing what we feel is the very best for the entire city and we will continue to do everything possible to protect your interest and the entire city's interest. Thank you. That concludes the, um, that concludes the item. We will now go to um, – yes, I know how to count. Um, We'll now go to uh, the resolution regarding the uh, City Council uh, uh, Library uh, Observatory Board members. Uh, if you would, Steve Quintanilla will handle this, uh, this particular item, if you would, Steve. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you have two resolutions here. One is a City Council resolution and one is a Library and Observatory um, Board resolution and basically these two resolutions will designate the city council members and library board members as ex officios on the following commissions the library and Observ observatory advisory commission the community cultural commission community emergency preparedness commission community parks and trails commission historic preservation commission and speaker series commission and the traffic and safety commission as ex officios, the city council members will be allowed to attend and participate in these board and commission meetings as though they are members. The only exception is that they will not be allowed to vote. And they will also not be counted toward the quorum for, for any of these boards and commissions. And that simply, just, that simply means that they are not going to be required to attend these board and commission meetings if they choose not to attend. So fortunately, though, the good news is you will not be appointed as sex officials on the Rent Control Commission. That was established by the voters. So there you go. 
Thank you, Steve. Uh, if any member of the public wishes to speak on this item, now's the time to do so. If you're participating remotely, you would use the raise hand button on Zoom or star nine on your telephone. Christy, will you uh, do the public comment? Yes, I did not receive any speaker cards. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak? Seeing no one, um, I do not see anyone online either. Close the public comment period and turn this back to you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Isaiah. Uh, any of my colleagues would like to make a comment about this? Uh, let, let, let me say that the, the motivation for this is that uh, we feel it's best that all council members have the opportunity uh, to participate in all commission meetings and that give, this gives us the right to do that without any because we basically can participate, we cannot vote, and we cannot discuss it among ourselves as to the outcome of any particular items. But it does give us presence and visibility when it comes to remote work. So that being said, uh, I will ask for a motion um, to approve this item. So moved. All right, uh, and I will second that. Please, uh, there's a motion and a vote, and a second, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Okay. The next item will be the, um, uh, handled by Joseph Carpenter, and that's the fiscal year 2021-22 mid-year budget adjustments. Joseph, if you would, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good afternoon, members of the City Council. Today's presentation will provide a summary of the operating budget and highlight the proposed fiscal year 2021-2022 mid-year budget adjustments. The current operating budget adopted by City Council on June 3, 2021 includes approximately $28.7 million in revenue and $28.1 million in expenditures. Staff is proposing mid-year adjustments of $1 million in operating revenues and approximately $381,000 to operating expenditures which would increase the projected operating surplus approximately $618,000 from $685,000 to $1.3 million. Staff is requesting to increase budgeted operating revenues $1 million. Staff anticipates the city will receive $100,000 more in real property transfer tax, $500,000 in sales and use tax, $100,000 less in short-term rental certificates, and $500,000 more in development-related fees. On the expenditure side, the expenditure general fund operating expenditures are broken down into three object levels. The proposed $73,000 increase in department equipment or capital is for the purchase and outfit of two code compliance vehicles. This purchase was previously budgeted in fiscal year 2020-2021 but the order wasn't fulfilled until this fiscal year. Detailed on Exhibit A of the resolution, the approximately $308,000 increase in operations and maintenance is comprised of budget adjustments in four divisions. A $60,000 increase in budget and building and safety for plan check services and professional technical support, $70,000 increase in general government for increased insurance premiums, $98,500 increase in planning for the housing element and how we 111 specific plan updates, and a $80,000 increase in street maintenance for the maintenance of the low water crossing at Frank Sinatra Drive. The general fund sh summary shows the impact of the proposed budget adjustments to the general fund. As highlighted in green on your screen, the adopted general fund budget, including both operating and non-operating budget, had reserve spending of approximately $3.1 million. The adjustments discussed today intend to decrease this fund balance spending by approximately $618,000, resulting in revised estimate of reserve spending of approximately $2.5 million. There are two other budget adjustments outside of the general fund and the library special revenue fund that I wanna highlight, a $17,500 increase in insurance premiums and a $150,000 increase for a VX rail to replace old software at the library. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you for your time and consideration today. Staff is available for any questions. Thank you, Joseph. We'll go ahead and open up the 
a public comment period on this item. If any member of the public wishes to speak, now is the time to do so. If you're participating remotely, you would use the raise hand button on Zoom or star nine on your telephone. Christy? I did not receive any speaker cards. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on this item? Seeing no one, we do have one person online, Brad Anderson. Yes, hi, Brad Anderson, City of Anson Mirage. Uh, I'm just overly concerned about these mid, uh, mid-year budget adjustments, and, uh, and I'm glad the staff report was uh, pretty accurate with what they were saying. Uh, but again, city, uh, there was talk about transparency early, and how the city is mm. totally transparent, but I would disagree with that, and this is one aspect of that. Uh, I think, uh, well... Uh, it's just so, so much to go over that I will run out of time. So I'll go ahead and put this down in letter form, and hopefully we can submit that in the public record at the next meeting. And that's all I have. Thank you. There are no more speakers. Okay. To close the public comment period, turn this back over to you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Isaiah. Uh, does anybody on the council have any comment? No. None. Uh, all right, I'll, I will make a motion that the City Council of the City of Rancho Mirage and the Board of Directors for the City of Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory adopt the resolutions identified as resolutions A and C. Second the motion. Then. There's a motion and a second. Uh, j- just to clarify, Mayor, uh, A through C. I, a through C, I'm sorry. Thank you. A uh, motion and a second, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Mayor, I think we should uh, compliment Joseph and Kofi about the outstanding job they did in preparing this report. Does it involve any pay increase? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. there's no budget adjustment on the, on the compliment, is there? Good job, guys. Oh, that is... Uh, That is approved. <clears throat> okay, the, uh, the last item uh, scheduled for today is by Ryan Stendell, our public work director, and that's the award of a contract to McAuliffe and Company. Ryan, if you would, please. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I had about a 45-minute presentation teed up, but I'll, I'll do what I can to uh, move us along. Uh, Cut it to 40. (laughs) Jason, if I could get my presentation. There we go. Um, By way of agenda, moving through, this is a condensed version of the study session that uh, Gabe and I gave back in uh, October of 2021, uh, where we discuss, and and we'll go through it briefly, and where we've been from that point. Uh, The amphitheater, Ranch Mirage Amphitheater, has been in operation for a little over six years, hosting an extremely wide variety of events. And the, elevated, the elevation of said events just keeps getting better and better over the years. Um, some of the operations teams have noticed a couple of areas that uh, we can improve upon if we want to keep taking those events to the next level. And as we discussed in great detail at the study session, that, uh, those three areas kind of center around a sense of arrival when you arrive in the park. Uh, Where do you land? Uh, Is there a a guest services area that kind of draws your eye and attention as you walk into either side of the facility? Um, Food service has become extremely popular uh, and very successful. Uh, We see some low-hanging fruit with uh, additional event spaces by just flattening existing turf area, uh, an existing turf area on the east side of the facility. And like many public projects, we always underestimate the amount of storage we're going to require. And as we're working with our partners who are producing plays or concerts, et cetera, um, we can always use a little bit more in the storage area. Um, So right here, you're looking down at an aerial of the Ranch Mirage Amphitheater. On the right-hand side of the screen, you're seeing the parking area. On the left-hand side of the screen, you're seeing a little bit of the the traffic circle, and San Jacinto Drive to the bottom. We've overlaid the plan into this uh, from a plan view 
And a few just very uh, quick bullet points. The service kitchen uh, can be located to the rear or the back of house, which will help keep uh, the dirty work, so to speak, uh, where it belongs in the back of house. And you don't see that off to stage left as a user of the uh, attending an event. Uh, again, we're talking about a very easy project to level the terrace um, and remove some uh, landscaping to create an additional flat space that could be very useful. Additional storage areas could be taking adv advantage of negative space that exists in the facility now. And again, those entryways that I talked about very briefly. So uh, staff released a request for proposals in January of this year. Uh, we received three total proposals and a review committee made up of marketing and public works is recommending award to McAuliffe and Company Inc's architects out of Palm Desert, California, uh, based, out of, based on their uh, experience with municipal projects, their ability to help us control costs through design and their efficiency uh, and ease of meeting with staff on site. So Councilmember Townsend loves to ask me, Ryan, when's it gonna be done? He loves to ask everyone. So I'm going to use a term that the city attorney's office uses with us all the time, uh, and that depends. But I just wanted to, uh, no. <laughs> I wanted to reiterate um, what we kind of mentioned at the study session, which is there's sort of two scenarios. If the city council um, is excited for the 50th anniversary of the city as staff is in programming, um, we're looking towards scenario B. Uh, and we don't see any good reason uh, to not, which is we want the amphitheater online for February, March, April of next year for some 50th anniversary programming. So we're gonna be working our uh, improvement schedule around that. The net impact to the project is a little bit more time, um, which is not uh, all that big of a deal. And the feasibility of how that breaks up, if you ask me, hey Ryan, which portion will be when and where, it's not known yet, but what we're going to do is build in those three months to the schedule so that we can still use the facility next year with the 50th year anniversary. So with that, uh, that concludes staff's report and um, myself, Mr. Cotting, and actually the architect is in the uh, audience if you have any questions for any of us. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> if, yes, uh, I have a question naturally. Can we do public comment first, uh, Mayor Pro Tem? No. <laughs> okay, <laughs> go ahead. Who comes first here? <laughs> oh, go ahead. You just found out. I did. You set the rules, not me. <laughs> uh, if any <laughs> member of the public wishes to make a public comment on this item, now's the time to do so. Uh, if you're participating remotely, you would uh, use the raise hand button uh, or star nine on your telephone. Christy? I do not have any speaker cards. Anyone in the audience like to speak? And seeing no one, and I do have one hand raised online. That's Brad Anderson. Yes, hi again, Brad Anderson, City of Rancho Mirage. I'm opposed to this, uh, just because I think it's Whitewater Park, is it? Yeah, uh, just because it's, it's an extravagant amount of money, again, uh, for something that's not necessary, unless it's safety-related, like sidewalk maintenance and so forth, but that's not an issue. It's just the redesign for apparently an anniversary. And I, I think we should really preserve, you know, conserve the city resources. I mean, I know, um, I know the city. I think FEMA. I don't think they paid us back or your, your city back, and then you loaned money to the car dealership. And and I think this is just a bad move at this time because it's not necessary. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And it doesn't look like there's any other speakers. All right. Uh, I'll turn this back to uh, Council. Charlie, you did want to make a comment. Well, I don't know if I do now. Okay. I was so abused. All right, I, I will. Is there another phase, Mr. Ryan, that is going to be, or is in the works, or do you want to talk about that for now or not? Is there a next step of more going into the amphitheater? No. We've got a comprehensive list here, and I think... Uh, that it's reflective of the study session that we gave back in October, and all of that is included in the plan. Very good, I appreciate that. <clears throat> I'd also like to say again to you, your staff, Gabriel, same with you, and uh, everything that uh, you have done, all of you, 
And I will say even Isaiah, who has stood behind you guys to see that these innovations come to fruition. And uh, I, for one, as you know, am very proud of the amphitheater. The programming that you are doing is um, unbelievable. Really good, really good. Uh, it just keeps growing and growing and growing. And as Ted always snickers when I say, we are the Hollywood Bowl of Rancho Mirage. So almost, almost. <laughs> Almost, almost. Thank you. It's wonderful. Thanks, Charlie. We know we might kid a lot, but we know how passionate you feel about it. Yes. Uh, for sure. Ryan, uh, let me ask you a question. It's uh, not, not related to this particular uh, request, but it is connected to the development. And that has to do, did we not receive a grant uh, for the improvement of the sidewalk on San Jacinto? and uh, kind of bring us up to date on that, uh, where it stands, and the timing, if you would, please. Yes, there's, there's certainly a lot of um, interesting improvements going on in this region between uh, planning's uh, efforts through their specific plans, the SB 841 grant that we've received, which you just referred to, which will help us enhance pedestrian safety in the region from um, generalizing San Jacinto at the Ranch Mirage Library all the way to the river, um, where we'll be able to, again, create safer, hopefully lit pathways that'll help as these big events keep growing, safety to be at the forefront. So where is it at? Uh, we're still in the project development phase. Uh, our engineering team is working on getting consultants on board to uh, design our ultimate project. So it's, it's in its very beginning design. What would be any, any prognostication regarding timing? Not at this point. It's too early to tell. Okay. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Richard, for that enlightenment. Uh, are there any other comments? I'll just make a, a short comment because I don't think anyone ever anticipated how popular our amphitheater would become throughout the entire Coachella Valley. I know we have an enormous amount of people asking about having their events there, and it has become uh, something more than just an entertainment venue. And uh, it, it is glorious to see all these improvements being made so that we can um, accommodate more people with more, more types of uh, entertainment and uh, educational lectures. So I think that uh, this is something that none of us anticipated, but it has been, you know, another feather in our camp in Rancho Mirage, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. Charlie, would you like to make a motion on this item? It would be my pleasure, and I think I'd be very upset if you didn't ask me to do this. <laughs> and, the, and that's the last thing in the world I would want, Charlie. <clears throat> All right, here I go. I recommend that the city council authorize the mayor to enter into an agreement with Mick. Alfleury, now, how do you say it? McCulloch. McCulloch and Company, I knew I'd blow it. In the amount not to exceed $386,241 for the preparations of the construction documents for the Rancho Mirage Amphitheater Expansion Program, CP21-371. And I'll second that. Well, there's a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. That concludes the, uh, the meeting today. Uh, we are not scheduled for a closed session, so that um, this meeting is... Oh, that doesn't mean it won't be used. Uh, that concludes our meeting, and uh, the meeting is now terminated. Thank you. <laughs>